Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Joint Legislative Commission on Governmental Operations Subcommittee on Hurricane Response and Recovery. I would like to first recognize the families that have taken the time to join us today. Members from both parties in the House and Senate have heard from most of you. We understand your frustration on how long it's taken to get in your homes repaired or replaced. But know this, information and testimonies which you have provided to our staff have guided our approach today. Our goal is to get, get each one of you back in your homes. Whether you have been displaced or living in homes with leaky roofs, holes in the floor, or even mold on your walls, we are here to get you home. You are the reason we are here today. In our September hearing, we asked NCOR Director Laura Hogshead to come back with updates on the progress of NC Rebuild Program for repairing and replacing the homes damaged or destroyed by Hurricanes Matthew and Florence. They have been providing us weekly updates to our staff as well as holding informal and formal discussions to supplement the materials provided. When Director Hogshead appeared on September 14th, 115 families had been out of their homes for a year or more. NCOR has since moved 10 of these families into homes, but 38 more families have passed the one-year mark. Director Hoghead has acknowledged the program is moving too slowly. She has taken steps in recent months to change that direction. Improvements are late and not as fast as any of us would like, but at least people living in uninhabitable conditions or motels have moved in, but there are still many who have not. While acknowledging the problems with rebuild under her watch, I do want to commend Ms. Hogshead on her willingness to take the arrows for even things that were beyond her control. Also joining us today is Department of Public Safety Secretary Eddie Buffalo. Secretary Buffalo should be <clears throat> begin to make clear how much of this progress has been the lack of accountability provided by his agency and Governor Cooper, or how much of this slow progress has been because they have failed to provide in court with adequate support. We're all eager to hear your explanation. At this time, I would like to yield to Senator Jackson for any opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to hold my comments to later on in the, into this, see how we come about with what we've learned and how much progress has been made since we met back in September. I'm hoping to hear great things if not, I'm hoping to hear other things as well, how we can address this problem, because this is certainly a problem. And I hope most of you were able to watch the documentary last night. I thought it was very well done, and I thought it brought home the point of just how dire this situation is. And as a North Carolina senator and a citizen of North Carolina, I'm embarrassed. And again, families and victims, I apologize for the failure that we as a state government have done for you. So with that, we'll move forward, Mr. Chairman, and go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. With that background, I would now like to recognize our committee clerks, Lori Bird from the Senate and Brooke Mason from the House, as well as our Sergeant of Arms from the House, Jonas Cherry, Russell Salisbury, Stafford Young. From the Senate, Michael Cavanis, Robert Cordell, Jake Dorn, and Rod Fuller. Thank you, gentlemen. Our first, excuse me, our first witnesses today are Leslie Albritton and Ashley Campbell from Legal Aid North Carolina. Ms. Campbell is CEO of Legal Aid and Ms. Albritton heads the organization's disaster relief project. Legal Aid has operated more than 600 cases against NCOR, resolved 99 of them in some form of decision. Ms. Albritton's written comments are included in the record and I hope the members of the committee have had a chance to read it. If you will step to the table. If you would, raise your right hand. Do you affirm that your testimony is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. You may be seated and begin your remarks. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairperson, members of the committee. 
I'd like to thank you for requesting that I speak with you today about Legal Aid of North Carolina's experiences representing clients within NCOR's Rebuild NC program. I'd like to begin my comments with a brief overview of our law firm and in particular of the firm's disaster relief project. As I'm sure most of you are aware, Legal Aid of North Carolina is a nonprofit law firm that represents low-income North Carolinians in civil legal matters across the state. We serve all 100 counties of North Carolina. Since February of 2019, we have had a dedicated team of attorneys, paralegals, and social workers handling cases for survivors of natural disasters in our state. Now, I lead this team as its managing attorney. We work with clients on a variety of legal issues that they may experience post-natural disaster. However, the vast majority of cases that we handle involve the restoration and preservation of what is, for most of our clients, their greatest asset and the greatest piece of intergenerational wealth they have, and that is their homes. In that context, we have worked to help clients access funds from a variety of sources, including the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the State Office of Budget Management, or OSBM, who I believe your committee heard from in the last hearing, a variety of charitable organizations and local recovery groups, and primarily the Rebuild NC program. And since Rebuild NC began accepting application, over 650 North Carolinians have sought our services. As Mr. Chairman alluded to, we have submitted written comments about our experiences with the Rebuild program, along with recommendations for policy um, improvements. Now, those comments discuss the breadth of our experience since the beginning of the program. So in the interest of time, I'm going to focus my comments today on Legal Aid's experiences with the program since the September 14th hearing that you held. Currently, our office is working with around 178 clients who are still in the Rebuild NC program. And I want to let you all know that these, some of these numbers are hand counts and that our case numbers fluctuate day to day. So these are approximations, but they're pretty close to where we believe we are as I sit here today. Now, our caseload of rebuild cases has decreased substantially over the past several months. This is partly because our project is entirely funded by grants, and our grant to handle cases related to Hurricane Florence expired around June of this year. So we're now funded to handle cases for people who are recovering in the state from the 2020 and 2021 storms. And because of that, we've had to make some difficult decisions, one of which is to close our cases for our rebuild clients once they reach the stage where they have successfully signed a grant with the rebuild program. And I think that's important for this committee to know because it limits my ability to give you up-to-date information about how the construction process and the construction phase of this program is going since September 14th, which I know is something that was of interest to the committee. But we do have a handful of clients who are still in that phase that we've retained, so I'll try to give you some information about that as best I can. So I'm happy to report that Lance, um, and I'm sorry, if I say Lance, forgive me, that's our internal, we love jargon, as I'm sure you know, in, in a nonprofit law firm. Lance and legal aid are the same thing. I'll try to catch myself. But um, so Lance has observed several significant improvements in the, the delivery of services to our clients since that previous hearing. However, we also to continue to observe delays and issues in some areas. Now, slightly prior to the September hearing, NCOR established a weekly call with our clients 
that allows our attorneys to speak with their supervisory staff to receive updates about our clients' cases. We've also instituted, and this was NCOR's idea, a joint spreadsheet where my attorneys can input information about our individual clients' cases in hopes of NCOR staff providing information about why our clients might be stuck in a step or whether there's additional information that they need. Those have been great improvements, and they have reduced some of the frustration that our clients have experienced when trying to get updates about their cases from their individual case managers. Turning to our case numbers, since September, we have received seven appeal decisions from NCOR. This represents an increase in the rate of appeal decisions that we normally receive. Previously, we could go months without receiving an appeal decision from NCOR. However, we still have about 11 appeals pending. Of those appeals that are still pending, six of those predate the September hearing. One of those is over one, or I'm sorry, yes, over one year old. One of them is 11 months old, and another is seven months old. Now, according to our case data, we have only received two new award letters since the September hearing, and we currently have 105 clients who are awaiting award decisions. Of those 105 clients, their applications were submitted as early as March of 2019 and as recently as November of 2022. So it's a broad range. For all of those cases, we believe that we have submitted all the required information and documentation necessary for our clients' cases to move forward in the decision process, and we've submitted that application to their case managers. Of the clients who are awaiting award determination, five have been waiting since 2019 for a decision. Now, I want to make clear to the committee that a couple of those cases we acknowledge have more complex legal issues than the others, but for the others who have experienced such significant delays, we have no idea why the delays have been so lengthy, and that's despite being in regular communication with the client's case managers and with uh, rebuild staff, higher level rebuild staff for update. And just a word about why those delays are significant. I think we all know that in the landscape of disaster recovery, resources are finite. And as lawyers, we understand and acknowledge that we're not going to get a favorable decision in every single case. However, one thing that we committed to doing as a firm is to finding other resources for our clients. Not everybody is going to qualify for every recovery program out there. So, when our clients are turned down by FEMA or they're not, their, their case doesn't fit what OSBM is looking for. We like to be able to have that conversation with our client about why they may not qualify and, and move forward and find them another solution. And the longer we wait for decisions, the fewer resources are out there in the alternative for our clients. So that is a frustration that we share um, with our clients. Turning to the grant signing process, that has improved significantly since September. Our clients are now able to sign their grant agreements at the same time they receive their award letter. And that's a substantial improvement. Previously, we experienced clients accepting an award and then waiting a very long time before they could move into that grant signing. So this process has essentially removed a step in our eyes of the rebuild process and speed things up for our clients, which we're very appreciative of. Unfortunately, an area where we have not seen significant improvement is communications with case management staff. And so I'm sure you all are aware that's the, that's the NCOR staff that has, um, or the, sta the staff in the rebuild program that has the day-to-day -day communication mostly with the applicants. Um, and this is especially true where clients are assigned a new case manager. So in the, since September, my staff reports that roughly 75 of our clients have been assigned new case managers. 
Now, we at Legal Aid understand and acknowledge that NCOR is in a process right now of moving from Horn staff to state employed case managers. So we anticipate that there will be turnover in the case management staff. However, the um, problem with this is that 46 of those clients were not informed of this new assignment nor was my staff who was working on those cases. And it took some sleuthing on the part of my staff to find out who those new, new case managers are. This has been a consistent problem the entire time we've been representing Rebuild clients. We've experienced a great deal of case management, manager turnover, and our clients are rarely informed of those new assignments. And the reason this is significant is that the communication between old case manager and new is not always, um, aside from the obvious that it slows down the process while we or our clients try to figure out who we're supposed to be communicating with, it's also led to a loss of documentation to our clients having to resubmit pieces of their application that they've already submitted to a, a subsequent case manager, which in turn slow, slows things down. So turning to the limited information that we have about the construction phase, we still have about 50 clients who are technically in the construction phase. Those 50 clients are still awaiting demolition for the most part. Since September, we have received no new notices to proceed, and only two homes have been demolished of our clients' homes. And just briefly addressing the temporary rental assistance program, we only have a handful of cases who are, are clients, excuse me, who are receiving those benefits. Um, and the good news is that our clients have increased that they're, they have increased flexibility now about where they can live within that program. And I'm sure that all of you can appreciate that that is a significant benefit to folks who are getting that assistance because those of you from Eastern North Carolina know that uh, with repeated impacts from Matthew and Florence, affordable housing is really at a premium right now. Um, however, they also report that sometimes rental payments are still delayed. Um, and again, we have too few clients in that program to really provide a very accurate overview of how it's progressing, but that's what our clients are telling us at this point about that program. So in conclusion, I hope that this information, which I know was, was numbers heavy, is useful to this committee. Um, I want to reiterate that we really appreciate the increased communication between NCOR's upper level staff and the staff at Legal Aid. That type of communication provides numerous intangible benefits to our clients, and I think the greatest of which is that our clients have increased or renewed faith in the rebuild program and that they know that they can get reliable information about how their applications are progressing. And I actually think it increases our clients' appreciation and um, faith in us because we can provide them with some accurate information versus going to case managers like we were doing before. So we're very grateful for that improvement. Um, in conclusion, I just want to make the point that my staff is acutely aware that every single one of the numbers I've presented to you today represents an actual person or an actual family who is waiting to return to their home or living in substandard conditions while they wait for their home to be repaired. It's our position that these recovery funds belong to the people of North Carolina. And one of the things that I really enjoy about the role I have now is that after many years of being in court all the time, this is work where those of us who do disaster recovery are all on the same team. And we all want the same thing. We all want the people of North Carolina and the communities in North Carolina to recover better. And um, it's all of our responsibility, therefore, to ensure that recovery resources, whether it's attorneys or money like the Rebuild on Sea program administers, get into the hands of the people who need it as quickly as possible. So I thank this committee for your time today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Albritton, and thank you for helping the people affected by uh, Rebuild NC. Uh, we do have a few questions from committee for you, and I would like to start with Senator Perry. Senator Petty, uh, Perry, I yield. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Albritton, thanks for your testimony today. Um, 
In your written testimony, you indicated that you guys have opened 650 cases related to rebuild and 99 have been resolved since 2019. So that means that 85% of the issues that have been opened since 2019 are still hanging out there. Um, that's incredibly high. And you, you mentioned that you have case files that you know or you believe to be complete and you get no response to some of them since 2019. Is that, uh, well, that, that's accurate based upon what you shared with us, but what are the, the primary obstacles to that case resolution? Is it turnover in those positions? But even if it is, you indicated that you've spoken to someone up the ladder, why is no one getting back to you? Give us a little more color on that, please. Happy to, um, to the extent that I can I can speculate about what the reasons are. And I want a word about our, our 650 roughly number. So those are the number of calls we have received where NCOR would be what we would consider to be the adverse party. And of course we recognize that it, you know, ideally those cases are not always adverse. Now those cases have been, could have been closed for a variety of reasons. I don't have all that data for you today. Um, some of our, our clients, um, we lost track of during the very long application process. Some of them were withdrawn from the program involuntarily because case managers couldn't get in touch with them or because we couldn't get in touch with them or because they decided or voluntarily because they decided to pursue other options. We've also had clients who came to us to apply for rebuild and we determined we're better suited for other programs like OSBM. Um, however, if I can speculate about some of the reasons for the delays, I do think the turnover in case management staff from our perspective has been a very big issue, um, both for us and for our clients. Um, in terms of understanding where cases are stuck, it's sometimes and somewhat dependent on the individual case and client. We've had cases where we disagree with the interpretation of laws that are applicable to disaster recovery like the Stafford Act um, or where we disagree with, um, frankly, NCOR's interpretation of its own guidance or where the guidance has changed because, you know, programs do go through updates and that's to be expected, but it may have changed um, in, in the process of our clients being approved or in between their application process. In terms of the communication breakdown, I definitely think that that has to do with the turnover in case management staff. Case man and the case management team is quite large, so when we're going to individual case managers for updates, it's dependent very much on that individual case manager's um, feelings about providing that information to our team and on their understanding of the program guidance. Do, do you still have packets today that are completed that your organization has submitted to rebuild and you have not received any communication on those packets? I don't believe we have cases where we have received no communication. Um, the issue is more um, with the fact that sometimes communication does not translate into action. I think we've greatly improved the communication. I don't know that the communication always moves the ball forward for our clients. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. I will now recognize Senator Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Albritton, thank you for being here with us today and your testimony. You mentioned something about prior, prioritization. You mentioned that income prioritization was not being, didn't appear to be practiced. Could you talk to us a little bit about that and your experience and, and also with the vulnerable populations like the elderly, the families with children or persons with disabilities? Are they being prioritized? I can only speak to, of course, the, our clients' experiences, but um, I'm sure that, Senator Jackson, you can appreciate that 
you know, our clients are all not just low to moderate income, but low income. Uh, we serve generally clients that are within 187.5% of the federal poverty guidelines. And we have, and many of our clients who are in this program, I would say um, proportionally a larger number than, than Lance serves at a whole are, are el what we consider to be elderly. So over the age of, of 60, I know that, I'm not sure I agree with that characterization personally, but that's, that's how Lance characterizes elderly. Um, and many are families with children. And we have not seen that those considerations move our cases forward any more quickly than other applicants. Okay, thank you. Have you noticed if this vulnerable population and with that clients you've been working with have faced additional burdens or challenges when dealing with the NCOR? I think it's, it's hard for me to say that our clients who are represented by us have faced additional burdens because they have the buffer of an attorney between them and the agency. We hope that we provide, you know, some representation in that way. Um, I would say that it's a particular burden from my perspective as an attorney representing um, elderly clients for those clients to have to resubmit documentation that they've already submitted to the agency. Um, you know, it, Technology is not always our friends, and many of our clients lack access to, you know, we represent a largely rural population on top of um, clients who are elderly and may have um, disabilities. Um, and it, it's difficult to gain access to things like fax machines um, or, you know, to have the resources for postage to continuously mail documentation into the program or, to make copies. So we've had experiences where our clients have given the original of, of a piece of documentation to their case manager, and that's been misplaced by one case manager, and then they have to figure out how to get another copy. So I do think that it, from my perspective, speaking from my perspective only, that those types of circumstances do place an additional burden on vulnerable populations and on rural populations. And one thing our firm did during the pandemic was to move to using uh, resources like DocuSign and scanning apps to make it as easy as possible for our clients to get information to us um, or going to their homes and calling them and saying, you know, we'll be at your mailbox in five minutes, so put what you've got out there and we'll mail it back to you um, to reduce that burden. Okay. Thank you. One more follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. So this vulnerable population, how, how large a portion of, of these groups do you represent? You know, I, what I can do, I don't think um, I can give you a percentage of our rebuild clients for two reasons. The first being that numbers are not my bailiwick, and so um, I wouldn't want to come up with a percentage that's completely off. I can follow, that's the most important reason. I could follow up with you and tell you exactly, if you want to let me know exactly what populations you're interested in, I could probably easily tell you which portion of our projects um, clients are over the age of 60, for instance. Well, and thank you for that, and I understand that, but what I'm interested in is, is the elderly, as well as the families with children. I mean, those are the ones that, uh, and persons with disabilities, those three categories. And I can, I can have that information for you. That's the report that we can run okay. in our case management system. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Jackson. The chair will now uh, recognize Senator Jarvis for a series of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Ms. Albritton, for being here and your testimony. Um, Horn who NCOR previously contracted with to implement steps one through five of the program, stated that their team members numerous times ran into it, is, issues where they recommended best practices 
uh, to NCOR, but those recommend, recommendations were not always followed or not implemented by NCOR. Has legal aid shared recommendations with NCOR, and have those recommendations been followed? One thing that I think has been really um, successful between legal aid and NCOR staff is the fact that they will periodically reach out to us and ask for recommendations if there is um, a practice that's affecting our clients that we um, think could be handled in a different way. And um, whether or not those recommendations have we don't expect all of our, first of all, let me back up and say, we don't expect all of the things, to get all the things we want ever for a client or for our clients. You know, we, we understand we're attorneys, we, we win some, we lose some. Um, some of the policies that, that in pro, well, more practices that we discussed early on, um, and these, these, some of these predate really um, even the formation of NCOR. When, when the CDBGDR money was first being applied for, or first received by the state, um, definitely have not been implemented. And an example of that would be, um, to give you a tangible example, our recommendations about how to handle people who are on what we call often in North Carolina family-owned land or air property. That is a fact of life in this state, um, being a rural farming um, community, in the, especially in the areas that are, are flood prone. And it's our, it was, it's been our position from the start that there are ways to um, quickly and um, efficiently uh, move through applications for people who are living on and own air property um, while still ensuring that the money is being used appropriately because we know that accountability is important. Um, and those recommendations have not been implemented. Uh, how long were the recommendations that Horn made? How long were they setting before they were even implemented, any of them implemented? So I'm not very familiar with any types of communications between Horn and NCOR staff. And for our purposes, when Horn was subcontracting with NCOR, they're basically one and the same from our perspective. Um, so I can't tell you what policies Horn recommended and whether or not they were followed. So one, one additional question, do you have you know, since NCOR has taken the process, has it improved since Horn had it? I, th I believe the transition from Horn to NCOR, permanent NCOR staff began prior to that December, excuse me, September 14th hearing. And um, so, the, the data that we focused on for this hearing was really that from September 14th on. So I can tell you that from our perspective, especially in terms of the changeover in case management staff, we do see an improvement based on those numbers and in those areas that I have described. For instance, it is really, I can't emphasize enough how valuable it is for us to have open communication between NCOR staff and legal aid. And that's something that as attorneys, you know, we sort of expect in a process like this. And with upper level staff who is able to make a decision uh, versus case managers. So in those areas we have seen improvements. We've definitely seen more appeals being decided. And one of the things that we did we started this project handling clients who had applied for just the Hurricane Matthew funds. And people were coming to us 
and they were um, already in the application process and they may have been denied and so we were handling appeals. So one of the things we decided with the Florence funding was that we were going to get in at the very beginning and help people with their applications in the hopes that that would move things along. And so up until the last few months, I, I would love to say that our assistance made a huge difference in how quickly people's applications moved, but I don't think that it necessarily um, necessarily did, even though, again, as I said, we, we felt from our perspective we'd, we had submitted everything that was necessary for, for folks' applications and helped them gather that documentation. So I do think there has been improvement, and I hope that my testimony reflected that, but I can't say for certain whether it's the transition from Horn that's made um, made all the difference. Okay, thank thank you. From what I'm hearing, if I understand correctly, then you're saying there's been very little, if any, improvement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Jarvis. The gentleman from Cumberland is recognized for a series of questions. Senator Davia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Albright, Ms. Albritton, um, first, thank you uh, for being here today, um, for your testimony, and more importantly, for the work you do uh, and your organization does across our state for our citizens. Speaking of that, so has the caseload impact that you've seen with NC Rebuild is not something that was anticipated, per se, years ago. Has that affected the workload uh, on the other programs uh, where that serve low income our low income population. I'm glad you asked that question. That that that's um. We are always resources are always a concern um, in our organization. Obviously, I think they are. It is for all nonprofits. Um, we have been very fortunate with our disaster relief work to be entirely funded by a series of grants that enabled us to hire dedicated staff for the purpose of representing clients in these types of cases. And that's really, it, that was important for us because this is not the type of work that Legal Aid of North Carolina does on a day-to-day -day basis in our local offices. So where it's had an impact, however, in terms of resources is that, um, you know, our grants to handle as I, as I noted in my testimony, our grants to handle cases from certain specific storms lasted for you know a certain number of years in the case of our, our our major grant for Hurricane Florence it was a three year grant so you can imagine that our grant funder anticipated we'd have things mostly wrapped up in three years so when we're dependent on um, being accountable to our, our, our funders um, and we have to change string, you know, we have to focus on a diff recovery from a different storm that definitely impacts the work we do and the resources that we have to do it. Um, and more importantly, I think it, um, it impacts our, our clients because we do have to make tough decisions. Like, um, at what's an appropriate point where we can tell our clients, we've gotten you this far, we think you can handle it from here on out, where, when we'd love to stay with everybody through the construction process and see that through. We have to tell our clients, um, we've gotten you to grant signing. Now, please call us if there's an issue. And most of those uh, individuals are in low income rural areas, correct? So all of our clients, um, our grants were specifically targeted at rural communities and our grants require us to serve people, the, the grant for Hurricane Florence and our current grant require us to serve people within 187.5% of the federal poverty guidelines. So not just low to moderate, but low income. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ms. Albritton. Um, Albritton, how would you, in just a sentence or two, how would you describe your relationship with NCOR? I think our relationship with NCOR is a good relationship in that we have open communication with their staff and that um, we ultimately, I hope, all want to help people recover from the storms that are a fact of life in our state. 
we find it at times to be a frustrating relationship when we can't get the progress that we want for our clients. Thank you. So I view you as a partner and a resource for NCOR, and I think that's what, where you've proven. I heard you say something in your testimony and looking at what, you, what was sent in that we received uh, yesterday. Um, you talk about a spreadsheet. So there's a case management system within NCOR through Salesforce. Um, do you have view access to that, the, the, the lack of communication and helping your attorneys or the people that are helping uh, with these cases and the individuals on the ground, would it be helpful for you versus a spreadsheet to actually view what is real time happening uh, with the case itself? Absolutely. I think that would be helpful for sure for us to have access to that. Um, you know, leaving aside, if I had a wish list, that would be on it. Sure. I'll just leave it there. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you again for all the work you do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Waddell, you're recognized for a series of questions. Thank you, and thank you for this report. It shed a lot of light on information that I did not already know. Um, unfortunately, uh, members of this, of the minority members on this committee received this document yesterday, and it would have been helpful to have gotten it earlier so that we could look at some of the information that you're discussing and so that we could have some other dialogue in relationship to it. Could you share with me any reason for the lateness? Was there something that happened, the reason that we got this late? I can't speak to, to why you got it yesterday. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know. Okay. Follow up. You recognize it. Um, <clears throat> secondly, I just learned yesterday that Legal Aid of North Carolina was going to testify today. Um, and I've listened extensively to your testimony and the details that you've given, which, you know, they've been eye-opening. But going forward, I'd like to request that greater consideration be given to notifying all members sooner when testimony is being offered. So as we move forward, I'd like for you to share a method that could be put in place so that we could get earlier notices. Uh, Madam Senator, are you asking me now to share a method? Oh, you can share it later. Okay. Um, I'm happy to provide you with my business card after the hearing, and so um, we can share information between our office and yours. Um, that, would be, that would be fine with me. Okay. Because it has been a constant occurrence on our bipartisan committee that minority members are not notified of witnesses until it's the last minute. We want to be more involved and more knowledgeable, but we have to get the information sooner. Thank you so much. And, and that goes for everybody, by the way. I'm happy to provide business cards to anybody on the committee. Senator Waddell, does that end your questioning? That ends it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Representative Stevens, you're recognized for a series of questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Albright-Britton, for being here. Um, and I, I appreciate the, the difficulty somewhat you find yourself in. Um, I, I do want to follow up with Senator Waddell at, at some point to let her know nobody else got it any earlier than she did. Um, but we appreciate what you've given us and appreciate that you'll be there for follow-up. Um, one of my questions is with the Horn Management Group, did you frequently hear that they had no access to the information, that they were limited in how much information they could get from NCOR? Yeah, and I'm, I'm, for folks' reference, and I know she's not sworn, so I apologize, I, this is um, A.D. Scaff, who is one of the supervising attorneys on our team, and she's been uh, our main um, supervisor of the, the rebuild work. And so I do believe that our staff had heard that from case managers, that they didn't have access to that information. In fact, that's one of the specific frustrations that we experienced with dealing with case management staff. Thank you. Thank you. And that's what I wanted to not make Horn the scapegoat here today because Horn expressed the same thing to us, that they couldn't get the information they needed to help the clients they were supposed to help. Um, 
Second thing, I've heard the discussion here today that they don't, that NCOR didn't seem to prioritize vulnerable populations or elderly people or disabled people. What, if any, priorities could you see they gave to anyone? I don't believe that we saw within our clients' cases prioritization of any particular cases over other cases at all. In fact, I will say that um, we've had a, you know, we, we've we've gotten a decent number of people um, to awards. Um, We've had a lot of clients drop off. And again, of the you know 105 cases that we have pending right now in the application, in various stages of the application, you know, between application and award determination steps, um, for the majority of them, we, we're not sure what the delay may be in making those application determinations. And again, some of them have only been submitted as recently as November. So, you know, we would expect maybe an award, not a decision not to be made by then. Thank you. But you did have some that were two years old. So even we the filing of the application didn't seem to prioritize things for in court. Correct. Yes. And, and I think I have one last follow up and that is you've worked with other state agencies. You've talked about that OSBM and emergency resources. How did your experience with them compare to your experience with NCOR? I actually was curious about that myself, so I pulled some numbers about our OSBM cases, um, or I should say that my fantastic staff pulled some numbers for me. It appears that we've had about 130 cases with the Office of State Budget Management, um, which we understand is a much smaller number than the number of cases we've had with NCOR. Um, the average wait time for those cases to get from uh, when we get approval, I believe, until completion is about four to six months. I think that's the average total time, actually, for those cases, about four to six months. Um, we, um, with the vast majority, I think apart from maybe two cases right now, all of our clients with OSBM are either... Um, in homes, or they will be within the next couple of months, we've been told. And, um, you know, our OSVM cases also include clients from Tropical Storm Fred. So that's obviously a much more recent event. So of this 130, some of those cases are not even Florence cases. They're as recent as Tropical Storm Fred. Um, you know, and the, the relationship with OSVM has been um, such that Sometimes we, again, have withdrawn people or made the decision to move our clients to that OSBM program because we think they'll have a better chance of getting into their home more quickly. We can't do that for every, or every client, obviously, because of the different requirements of the programs. We have to make some determinations about what's a better fit for our clients. Um, and then sometimes OSBM will, in fact, refer cases to us where they see um, that there is an issue, for instance, an ownership issue that they need help straightening out. And so we can work on that problem for them and then get the client back to them and, and get them in a home. Um, so so yeah. if I can summarize, I think you're saying they're more effective, efficient, and responsive. I, I do think that is a more um, responsive relationship, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Stevens. Representative Fless, you are recognized for a series of questions. I'm curious about Tropical Storm Fred. That's my area that I'm in. Um, how many cases, or do you know how many cases you have currently open with Tropical Storm Fred? And I'm, if, if it puts you on the spot, that's okay. We can get that later. That is a number that I did not pull, but I can get that for you um, for sure. I can tell you we have far fewer cases from Tropical Storm Fred than we did from um, Hurricane Florence or Matthew. Obviously, it was a it impacted a proportionally smaller area, but we are continuing um, to do that work. Um, and I will pull that for you. Well, I know uh, there's about 780, almost 780 homes that receive some kind of damage just from my interactions with my county manager. Um, I'd like to know that, but are you seeing any issues so far? I know Office of State Budget is primarily handling that, 
currently? Are, are you seeing any issues starting with those folks that you're dealing with, or is it too early to see that? Um, so, the I, I, I will say that I think with every, you know, natural disasters are a fact of life in our state, obviously, and it doesn't really matter what part of the state you live in. Uh, we all have a beautiful state that's prone to severe weather. Um, I think with every storm, all of us, whether it's the state or nonprofits, get better at streamlining the response. So from what we have seen, the response and recovery from Tropical Storm Fred, uh, and again, this is just what we have seen, has progressed um, more smoothly. There have been, the issues we have seen from Tropical Storm Fred have been unique. For instance, there, I'm, I'm, obviously you know there are a lot of homes where people share access and, and um, private roads or bridges were destroyed. And so that's been something new for, for our state to handle um, in terms of natural disaster. But for the cases we've handled involving those issues, I think for the most part, they have been resolved and um, it seems to be progressing well. I know there are still people who need help and um, one of the things we've been trying to do um, is to be in those communities more so we can find out what those needs are. Um, there, it's, it's a different part of the state, obviously, from the eastern part of the state, so it requires us, all of our work requires us to really get into our communities and talk to people and find out what the needs are. People don't necessarily think about lawyers going with natural disasters. Okay. I guess the thing I would ask is as you're going forward, uh, I would like to know uh, if there are issues. I know the poverty level there, I, I kind of understand where it's at. Um, and I know there's a lot of people that are going to need your services, and I've been in contact with some folks. Uh, I would like to see uh, early on wherever we see a problem. I don't want to repeat the things that we're seeing with Matthew and Florence. I, I have a lot of empathy for the folks that are experiencing that, but uh, unfortunately I can only deal with the problems that have happened. I, this one I would like to avert a lot of those problems. If we've learned lessons, I would like to make sure that those lessons are applied to this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just follow up real briefly and let you know that I can provide you with my card. So if you do hear of problems or people who need our help, you're welcome to make direct referrals to me. Okay. Representative Pless? That's it. Is there any other member of the committee seeking recognition? Representative Willingham, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Uh, uh, Ms. Albright, uh, I applaud the work that the organization does. And I've worked with Legal Aid for many years uh, in a bunch of areas. And I know you're dealing with things other than just this uh, hurricane disaster stuff. Let me ask you this, and this is kind of a continuation of uh, what was asked of my colleague from Cumberland County. How many um, employees uh, do you have right now? How large is your organization? How many people do you have working realize that my mic shut off, which probably means I shouldn't be talking anymore. <laughs> um, I think we're around 500 employees right now. Um, it, it, it varies, you know. Um. I understand that. Okay. Um, you have 500 employees or about. How many, uh, how many, right now, how many clients do you have that would be associated with INCOR? So currently we have 100 and let me make sure that I 178 clients with open files. Okay, and you mentioned too that you at some point you had some grant money to mm -hmm. help uh, with having some people dedicated to working on that. Uh, how many people do you have now dedicated to working uh, on that case or those cases within Core? We have, I believe. 13 attorneys currently, and that includes me. And we have eight paralegals, and we have two social workers who are on our team. 
And those are the folks, just so people understand why, why we would have social workers as part of a, a, a legal aid organization. They're instrumental really in finding those alternative resources I talked about for our clients. I understand that, thank you. Uh, now these people working full time just on these cases with these clients? Apart from a couple of folks on our team, yes, they are full time disaster relief project employees. And I, and I guess the reason I'm asking that too is that it seems to me that with that many people working, then there should be even more communication with NCOR than less. Uh, whether that agency is responding or not, then some kind of way, I guess you have to be more aggressive in trying to get uh, you know, the answers that you want or the communication that you need. Uh, would you say that's, I mean, how aggressive are those folks in working and talking to INCOR? So, you know, I think from my perspective, of course, you know, this is my staff and I'm very proud of the work they do. I think they're pretty persistent in getting the answers that they need. Um, you know, they will, they will call, they will email, they will uh, pester, the heck out of people um, to get answers. You know, that said, we're always open to feedback. I think every um, organization that serves the public should be open to feedback and, you know, always want to hear suggestions about what might be more effective. But I, from my perspective, my team works very hard to get answers out of not just NCOR, but um, any agency from, from which we're trying to get um, help for our clients. Okay, uh, the point I'm making uh, is that when you talk about communication, I mean, that's true in every relationship between agencies or, or even just here in the legislature. You know, uh, it's always, that's always gonna be some room for improvement in communication. And so it's not just one organization that's failing to communicate. Uh, I think we can throw all the organizations in that, in that bunch. Because one of my biggest complaints here, uh, the legislature, is that things happen that you know we feel like we should know, but we don't know. Uh, we're not informed, or uh, we feel like we've been informed uh, when we should have uh, known earlier before things happen. So, uh, so I, I just want to make that clear that I see this, you know, uh, it's an issue, communication, but it's something that can be worked out, and something that. I think between the organization and NCOR, uh, that can be, you know, solved at this point, especially now that we're going forward, we know what the issue is, and communication is one of those issues, and I think that's something that you can, you can, you can work with. Um, and I mean, now, Eastern North Carolina, I, I'm very familiar with what's happened with the hurricanes because uh, Princeville, um, and whole Eastern North Carolina, Tarbor area, uh, we've been experiencing this forever. I mean, I'm looking at a picture last night that where I was riding in a boat down Main Street in Princeville and in Tarbor. Uh, and I still have people who are still calling me about uh, not being uh, back in their homes, and this has been quite a while. So, so I'm concerned. I've also uh, wondered is one of the suggestions maybe that people who are in hotels now, who've been there for quite a while, uh, why can't we put those people in houses? Uh, I mean, is this a suggestion? Why can't we just put them in houses? Uh, might not be a house they own, but the amount that we're paying for hotels, it seems like we can rent a house or lease a house, real estate, uh, because I, work with some folks who still in hotels or was in hotels at the time. Uh, and I see, and I've seen what, what it does for a person or a family. I, I'm, I don't want to stay in a hotel room for a month or two months, much less a year or two years. So is there anything that would prevent court from doing that from you? putting class in houses rather than hotels? 
Well, you've hit upon a, one of the, the great concerns that we have for our clients, and this is n not necessarily directed at NCOR, but all recovery programs is the fact that living in a hotel, especially if you have a family, well, first, it, it makes you unhoused versus having a home is incredibly challenging for our clients. Um, I am not aware of any um, restrictions on their temporary rental assistance program, for instance, that wouldn't allow them to put people um, in homes. In fact, when um, it's available to our clients, they are able to access rental properties and use those funds to pay um, the rent for, um, for that temporary apartment or house. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you know that housing is always limited in our part of the state. I live, live in Pitt County. I just moved to Greenville from Farmville in the last couple of years. So, um, but, uh, but yes, I think that that would uh, be much better for our clients than living in hotel rooms, always. Okay, last thing. <clears throat> Uh, now, did you say in your early remarks uh, that there has not been any progress since we last met in September, or you feel like there has been progress? Oh, I definitely feel that there has been progress. Okay. Um, and I think I pointed to several areas where we have seen um, progress. And the numbers um, are simply the numbers. They're the number of, of cases we've had decided. and. Um, you know, again, I think communication has improved greatly since September. Okay, because the numbers I saw, it does look like in some areas their progress has been made. And uh, so I'm sure that uh, Ms. Halshead will explain the reasons for some of the ones that have not made as much progress as we would have liked to have seen. So I, I thank you for, for coming here today and, uh, and keep the good work up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Ms. Albritton, thank you for your testimony today. The committee wants to thank you for taking the time to appear here, and you are dismissed. Thank you. Our next witness will be Director Laura Hogshead with NCOR. Director, if you'd make your way, give the Sergeant Arms a moment to get your tent set. If you'd remain standing, raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm your testimony as truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated, and feel free to start your testimony. Thank you, sir. Is there an opportunity to show the PowerPoint that I submitted? Is it up and running? Yeah. Okay. It's the next slide. It's the next slide, they said. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for inviting me back to talk about the progress since last hearing. I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate all the conversations that I've had with you and your staffs over the last few months. What you asked me to do was to continue to take accountability, which I do, and you asked me to show progress. That's what we asked. That's where we ended on September 14th. And so I'm happy to be here this morning to show you the progress, understanding that it's not enough. It's not enough for anybody who's sitting behind me. It's not enough for anyone in Eastern North Carolina. It's not enough for anyone sitting in front of me. We continue to make progress. I want to show you what we've been able to do in the last 30, 90 days, excuse me, the last three months, and then talk about what's to come. This is fairly data heavy, but I will try to get through it quickly. So we have a few areas of focus that we want to make sure that we hit on. We have improved our constituent service through state case management teams. So we've hired a new chief of constituent affairs and we've put in a new structure for case management. I want to be clear, everyone has changed their case manager in the last six months because we moved from horn case managers to state case managers. I can't, I empathize and, but I cannot control the turnover that horn had. Those were their employees. They had high turnover. I know it's frustrating. I can better control the turnover of a state employee who is more likely to stay around, who is more invested in the mission, who is going to stick around. So everyone has changed their case manager, and everyone has been contacted by that new case manager. So I want to make sure that we're clear on that. The change was not another round of turnover. It was moving from Horn to the state. 
Officially, Horn began their transition period on September 14th, the date of the last hearing. That was predetermined three years before when we signed their contract, and they were done as of midnight on Monday. So this is now in state hands as of Tuesday morning, and we have hired up to accommodate that. Secondly, we worked to attract more general contractors to rebuild through our policy changes and our active recruitment. The last time we were here, you asked how many active general contractors we had. The answer was five or six. I apologize, I didn't go back and look. Now we're at 12. So we have attracted more general contractors. They are hard at work. They have won procurements. Speaking of that, we have successfully bid out a number of projects in the last three months. This says the last six months, and I apologize, that's a typo. 277 projects have been successfully bid through the North Carolina procurement system since September 14th. Those are projects that are now moving towards completion. They are in permitting. They are working to get done. Of course, our focus is to get more families in step eight. So to do that, we've had to focus a lot with local communities on the permitting process, on inspections, on the details of getting a home on the ground. And we are doing that work every day. So I'll show that in the next slide. And then, of course, prioritize the families that are in temporary relocation assistance, particularly those who are in for more than one year. I have slightly different figures than you had, Mr. Chairman, but I want to make sure that we emphasize that we are all working towards the same thing. We want to get families out of those hotels and leases. I have that we have already moved 18 home, 11 more will likely move home this month, and six are possible to move this month if it doesn't rain much more. So we are tracking those families. We track those families for your staffs every two weeks. We give a detailed update, and we want to make sure that you understand that we are looking at those families first. I want to talk about the numbers since September 14th. I won't go through all of them, but you can see on our focus for Step 8, we've gone from 789 families in Step 8 to 889 families in Step 8. That represents 76 completed construction projects in 90 days and 24 families that chose a reimbursement option. So that's 277 projects bid in 89 days since I submitted this yesterday and 100 families in step eight in 89 days. That is sustainable progress, but it's not enough. It's where we can build from. It is substantial progress for the last three months for 90 days, but it is something to build from. I want to look at the output. This was a significant question for you last time, and I want to look at the change, and I've got a graph on the next slide that will show this. In 2019, the monthly average was 32 homes completed. As the pandemic started to take effect, we went down to 22 in 2020. In 2021, the monthly average went down to seven as the COVID impacts were in full force. And prior to the updates that we made in this year, from January to August, we were at a monthly average of five homes, as you pointed out last time. That's clearly not gonna get the job done. However, the changes that we made before the hearing, starting last year with insourcing our contracts and making other policy changes, the average was at 17 at the end of the November. At the end of November, it's probably going to be at 30 at the end of December. We'll be happy to continue to report that to your staffs. And it will grow from there. Because of these procurements that we've made, because of the changes that we've made, it will grow from there. So that represents a 242% increase in production since September 2022, since the last hearing, when compared to the previous months of 2022. And you can see that here. So you can clearly see the decline and the increase that we are experiencing now. I want to talk about what happens before you get to construction, because everything that happens before you get to construction gets you into construction faster. Since the state staff has taken over steps one through five, and we did that incrementally over the last three months as Horn rolled off, we have saved days, and every day saved is, matters to families, it matters to us. So the average duration from step one to step two is currently at 102 days. It was at 164 days when this rested with the vendor. We continue to focus our efforts on the applications with the longest duration. Those are often the ones that have the most challenges. We're tackling those challenges. So 62 days saved on step one to step two. Duration from step two to step three, we've saved 31 days. We are currently at 66 days. The vendor was managing an average of 97 days. On step three, verification of benefits, we had 127 applications in this status when the state team took over. That was in August of 2022. Only 27 applications are in that status as of the end of November. That's the lowest that this list has been in two years, and the pace has increased from 19 a month to 188 a month. That's nearly 10 times as productive. For step four, inspections, this has been a spot where folks have waited far too long. Since we took over the function on November 1st, 
that's five weeks at the point that we put this presentation together, we had conducted a combined 108 asbestos and lead inspections. That's 18 more than the previous team was able to do. 48 damage inspections, 37 more than the previous inspection team was able to do in a similar period of time. And we are currently expecting 10 a week, which is approximately three to four times as fast as the vendor. We are also coordinating 75 environmental inspections scheduled per week. The previous inspection team was able to do 11 a week, so that's seven times more productive. All of this matters because we're getting people to awards and then to, con to construction. So the average pace of award generation has increased from 10 a month to 42 a month. The grant signings in that time have also increased by 120%. That's a sign to us that people are getting better information, they're getting their, answers, their questions answered, and the homeowners are signing faster than before. One of Ms. Albritton's points about being able to sign the award and move forward at the same time is, is very apt. It, it's showing here. The appeals, Ms. Albritton also spoke about the appeals. 260 appeals have been closed or withdrawn since August. Those appeals had been aging. Almost half were over, over five months old. And the average time to process an appeal has dropped from 185 days when the vendor handled this to 29 days under state control. The average pace of appeal completion increased from 35 a month to about 30, 57 a month. That's 1.6 times more productive than the vendor was able to be. Another area that you asked us to focus on was recruiting general contractors and paying them faster. So we've implemented several changes that DPS has helped us with since September. Since our discussion in September, we have been able to be exempted from the state's net 30 policy, which states that you hold an invoice for 30 days for cash management purposes. We've since been exempted from that policy and we are able to pay general contractors much faster. We also, we also added an additional check right per week, which gets checks out faster. We reassigned more finance staff to processing these invoices. And we have put a check writing vendor under contract. We're working right now to get that process stood up so that we can make direct payments to vendors starting in January. So that will be us with our vendor making check payments rather than DPS. So the change is coming in January. We will be making those direct payments through a third party disbursement service. We're working with the state treasurer's office and Bank of America to do that. We have streamlined our internal process so that we have removed any extra review steps and we're simplifying all of our tasks. We are targeting an average processing time of 14 calendar days. That matters a lot to a small general contractor. When a general contractor does payroll every Friday, we have to pay as quickly as possible. We certainly can't wait 30 days. 14 days is acceptable to them. They have indicated a great satisfaction with the increased payments that we've been able to make. But they know that what they need is an accounts payable calendar with published deadlines. So if you get the invoice in by the 5th, we are going to pay it by the 19th. We want to have a schedule for every month so that they can have some predictability so that they know how and when to pay their crews. So we are committed to payments that far exceed the state's prompt pay policy and a reliable and transparent calendar for our vendors. In conclusion, as you've noted, we've made progress but we are not satisfied and we will continue to focus on program efficiency and getting families home and we look forward to more partnership with you, our local governments and the families that we serve to make sure that everyone gets to step eight satisfactorily as quickly as possible. I appreciate your time and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Ms. Hogshead, as you can imagine, uh, I believe every member has a question or two for you, so I would like to start with Senator Perry. Senator Perry, you're recognized for a series of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Hogshead, thank you for being here today. Um, at our last hearing, <clears throat> we sort of closed the discussion uh, in talking about the over 100 families who have been out of their home for so long. and. Uh, we talked about getting them home by Christmas uh, as a as a goal. Um, as of today, how many families on that list of 115 families um, have returned home? So 18 have returned home, 11 more are scheduled to return home this month, and six are possible to return home this month. They are on pace to possibly get a December closing. You know, I, I felt like I was kind of throwing you a softball at that time because uh, as people have been out so long, I, I thought we'd get them home. Um, so I'm extremely disappointed in that number. That's, that's over 80%, 85 or so um, who aren't home. You know, I'm thankful some of them are, but that's, I don't have to tell you, that's, that's terrible. Um, such an impact on their, their lives. Uh, it's hard to believe that there was a focus in that meeting and the conversations we've had 
and only 18 are there. Um, that's terrible. Uh, of the ones that you have now, and I, I see the, the titles of under construction, and we move them to different phases, but you know, I drive around in my district, I go to those homes that say under construction, and nothing's going on in, in many of them. I, I think that's, that's um, misleading. Um, I, you know, when you sit here and you tell us that everyone's been contacted, I, I know you, I know you believe that. Uh, you set the process up, you told them to do it, but the number of heads that shook no when you said that behind you, I, I think that's part of the, the disconnect of, of the large uh, programs. But you know, you, so you've added some GCs, you're up to, was it 12 for a remaining 3,400 projects, that's 283 houses. It, you know, we're, we're not going to get there. Um, it appears that some of them haven't even been signed, assigned a contractor um, yet, been on there so long. I mean, how can that be? How are you going to increase that throughput? When are we going to be able to actually get these folks under construction? You, you mentioned the, the increases. Well, if I'm in school and I take a test and I make a five on the first one, and then a 50 on the next one, that's a 10x increase, but it's, it's not impressive. It, it's not enough. What, what are you gonna do? I mean, tell me what your plans are. How are you gonna increase <coughs> these rates to get these people back in those houses? Yes, sir. So 1,156 are currently in the hands of a general contractor. And then it comes up to how fast you can get the permits, how fast you can get the construction done. The 2021 that are not yet in the hands of a contractor are in steps one through five. Every time we put out a procurement, we clear the decks. We put out everything that is ready for procurement. So step six is in procurement and, and construction. And those two are put together, and I should be more clear about separating them out. Because in construction for us means the general contractor has been awarded, they are working on permits, they are working on easements, they are working on the architectural drawings. It doesn't always mean that you're going to see hammers swinging on that lot, but I can be more clear about that. But to answer your question, we always need more general contractors. That's part of the reason why we focused on paying them faster and holding them accountable. So, you know, again, we talked about those 100, and uh, since our last hearing, you're, you're indicating on those slides that you've completed 100 homes. That's right. Well, we've had 100 people move into step eight. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I want to be clear on that. And I, I think I hear you. I'm not sure everyone does. Um, that's not 100 homes completed. It's 74 homes completed, yes. So that's 100 cases closed uh, because of com combining of categories and reclassification of, of numbers. Um, how many of those just got a check to go and get someone to solve their own problems. So what we know about our applicants is that some folks, not a lot, but some folks entered this program for the reimbursement, not for the construction. So what we endeavored to do was to meet the need that they had expressed. They were willing to put up with the construction, but what they really wanted was the check. So we looked at our population, and if, there, if a person had less than $5,000 worth of repairs left to do, but they had invested 10, 15, 20, 25,000 dollars of their own money into repairs, they're in the program to get the reimbursement check, not for the 5,000 dollars of extra work. And so we called them and we gave them the option. You can continue with the construction, or we can pay you what is remaining. We can pay you your reimbursement and then let you handle the rest of the construction because you clearly have uh, the ability to handle the construction. 26 of them, I believe I said 24 before, 26 of them took us up on that option. That's why out of the 100, 74 are true construction projects, 26 are applicants that, it was their choice, said to us, we just want the check, please give us the check, because we invested our own money in the recovery. I, I would want that check too. I, I heard about the number of legal aid clients that have dropped out of the process, and I, I hear frustration from people, and I'm sure that, that many have, have had enough I would have, you would have, every family in here probably would have at some point after all of these years. So when you write that check, um, no one goes, I'm assuming, 
that no one goes in afterwards to make sure work's complete and what the family needs is, is actually um, finished, right? So we don't know that it's habitable at that point. So we can't really say those folks are home. We can just say they're no longer on that list. Is that right? No, sir. They have chosen the recovery that they wanted. And what they chose was the reimbursement rather than the reimbursement plus I understand rehab. the reimbursement. I'm asking, does anyone go verify that they are in their home? Yes, If they sir. take that they, check. Yes, sir. They were always in their home. So if they were just waiting on an under $5,000 rehab and they were waiting just for the reimbursement of their own funds that they put in, they never left their home. They elected to get that check and said they would take care of the rest of the recovery themselves. That is the, re is the recovery that they chose and they signed an agreement saying, I'm, I'm done. Now we have the scopes of work and we did review them to make sure there were no life health safety items on that. There are no electrical problems in those homes. Under $5,000, you all have done construction. Under $5,000 of construction is not serious issues. So if I understand and I'm referencing your, your words on the, the documentary um, from last night that was aired, you said, uh, and I quote, um, it was discussion about NCOR is different from FEMA because FEMA writes you a check, that is not full recovery, and then they walk away. So the families who are moved in that 100 home category because we now can take them off of list, we, we wrote them a check. How is that new NCOR policy any different than what FEMA does? It's a good question. So we went in with our inspectors and inspected both the work that that homeowner had done, and then oftentimes it was, again, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 worth of work that they had done themselves. And the only remaining estimated cost of repair was under $5,000. Again, it's their choice. Several people turned us down and said, no, I'd like to stay in the construction process. That's fine. We offered it as an option. But I, I do hear the parallel that you're drawing here. What we look at is the totality of the home. FEMA often comes in and off writes you a check for the roof. I, it, in my opinion, in looking at the numbers, writing a check removes someone from a column. Um, it makes the progress look a little better. But I, I don't think it's, it's meaningful. I don't think it's material other than to massage a slide. I think it's disingenuous. And I, I understand that when the, the lights are on, everyone wants to polish everything up, make it look as good as it can. But those folks behind us don't care about that. You know, they, they want to be back in their home. Um, you know, if, if it was an option, and I don't know all of the guidelines on the dollar amount level, but if it was an option to write people a check and let them handle their own problems, why didn't we do that before? Is this a, a new ability that we have? Why, you know, they're over there frustrated, can't get calls back, don't have updates, no one's at their home working. Why couldn't we do that earlier? It was something that the state considered early on, even before NCOR was stood up. Some states do pursue a recovery where they write very large checks to homeowners and let them handle their recovery. What we see in those recoveries is large amounts of contractor fraud because people get taken advantage of and it happens, right? You've seen it in other states. So what we elected to do was to control the general contractor process to assign reputable general contractors that have been tested to homeowners to complete the repair. So the option was available. It is, it is available. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad to see things speeding up. Um, glad to see that you've added some contractors. You've started 16 new rehabs, five new modulars, four bubble homes, and one construction. All the other projects that are finished were already underway prior to September 14th, correct? Yes, sir. I believe that's true, but I would want to verify those numbers. So, I mean, it's it's great to highlight progress, but you know where we are. That it's the same slow place. So you need to be at about sixty or so completions per month. Um, so your output is still half of where it needs to be in order to to meet that goal. Um, 12 contractors, that's 283 projects each, and I know some are 
modulars, mobile homes, rehabs, uh, reconstructions. But even after all of our questions, after prioritizing the low-hanging fruit with the rehabs, should be the fastest projects on there, after, after writing the checks, after a housing market is slowing, after getting to reserves of the mobile homes and the modulars, and the policy to write the check, after all these circumstances, we're, we're still not where we, we need to be, are we? No, sir, we are not, and I acknowledge that. We are trending in the right direction, but we are not at the output that we are satisfied with, no. And so those 277 procurements that I have signed since the last hearing have not largely hit the ground yet because they are in permitting, they are looking, they are getting architectural drawings, they are doing site surveys. This takes, it takes longer to get through the construction process than any of us want to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Perry. Uh, Chairman Jackson, you were recognized for a series of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Hoggood, thank you for being here with us again today. Um, at our last meeting, we had discussed the significant level of funding that your program has spent on TRA, Temporary Relocation Assistance. I believe at the last hearing, the cumulative total to date was $12.5 million, if my memory is correct. And now, based on the data that you've provided to staff and that they've got to us, we're now looking at $15.75 million on TRA. Is that correct? I have not independently verified that number, but I can get back to you on that. Okay. Well, digging into it, it looks like we're spending approximately five hundred dollars to $600,000 a month, uh, mostly on hotels and pods. Is that correct? I would need to verify those numbers. But we do spend a significant amount of money to house folks while we are doing construction, yes. Okay. You know, I'm not an expert, but I think the way we're getting this spending under control, the way to get this spending under control is to get people home more quickly, and I'm sure you would agree with that statement. I think everybody in this room would. Rebuild NC has a program called Emergency Move Out. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Could you briefly explain what that does? Emergency yes, sir. Move Out? Yes, so when a family identifies that they are in an unsafe home. We send an inspector out, we verify that, and we do an emergency move out ahead of them moving into construction. So we will move folks who are in an unsafe situation out of their home in order not to leave them in that unsafe situation. So you're saying they're put to a priority list, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. You know, and just to be clear, we have people who we know can't remain in their homes and who are stuck in motels, and yet we don't place any added emphasis on getting them out of hotels as soon as possible. Instead, you and your team are content to let them navigate bureaucratic, bureaucratic mess at the taxpayer's expense. And I know that sounds like a harsh statement, but that's probably the reality of the situation. I, I know you, you want to, but keep it down. Thank you. Sir, we do, we do prioritize those families and we give an update to your staff every two weeks on their progress and they have all seen forward movement. Okay. Well, based on the data provided by NCOR, nearly 28% of North Rebuild NC applicants are over the age of 70. Nearly 21% of the applicants have children under the age of 18 in the home and 39% of applicants have a disability. Granted, there is some overlap in some of these categories, but it remains true that a significant portion of the families in your program are deemed vulnerable, po vulnerable populations. Would you not agree? I do. Okay. And are you aware of the size of these vulnerable, vulnerable populations among your applicants? Yes, sir, I am. Okay. But you're not prioritizing them, correct? Or are you? We do, sir. So when we, we certify to HUD that we prioritize low and moderate income persons, we do that. Almost everyone we serve is a low or moderate income person. And one of the ways that we do that is that we offer them temporary relocation assistance. That's only offered if you are low or moderate income. If you can handle your accommodation otherwise, if you are over income, we do not offer that benefit to you. So we prioritize folks to get them into TRA and then to get them out of TRA faster. Well, for somewhere down the line in the communication, it appears that you're not being prioritized. And if that's the case, we're the only state in the Atlantic coastal area that it is in the southeast that does not prioritize. But you're telling me this morning you have been prioritizing these 
EMOs? Yes, sir. We do prioritize EMOs. We prioritize folks in TRA. I'm, I'm encouraged that we have the opportunity to clarify this with legal aid because we want to prioritize those folks who are most vulnerable. We have instituted a new escalation process in the last few months to make sure that those most vulnerable cases get risen to the top fastest. Let me give you an example. As you well know, Commission staff performs random site visits to more than 60 homes in the following counties. Bertie, Columbus, Craven, Duplin, Edgecombe, Green, Lenore, Pitt, Robinson, Sampson, Wayne, and Wilson counties. And you know that out of the more than 60 homes that they visited, do you know how many times they encountered contractors actively working on the home? I do not know that off the top of my head. Once. Only once out of 60 homes. Director Hoggs said this is unacceptable. By any stretch of the imagination, this is unacceptable. And, I, and I'm infuriated if you can't tell. You know, I've, I've always been told I don't have a poker face, so don't go play poker. Because you see about pretty much the frustration on my face for these North Carolinians. The lack of urgency that has been performed since all this began and trying to get these people back in their homes at the slow rate that has been going on is, is totally unacceptable. You know, I heard Willingham make the comment about staying in a hotel for a month. I don't like staying in a hotel two days, two nights. I can't even begin to envision staying there two, three years. I mean, this is just totally unacceptable, and I don't mean to get off on a tangent here. But there has got to be some improvement made in this program immediately. Or I'm going to use what power I have to redirect the funds to someone that can get the job done. That's all I've got to say. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Robinson, Senator Britt, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Hogg said, I'm going to ask you a series of questions if I can. Uh, for time's sake, I'd ask if you please just answer yes or no. If you don't recall, that's fine. And I'm going through some of the information you submitted uh, in coming up with these questions and uh, just wanted to just clarify a few things. Uh, now, it's my understanding there are currently 523 families waiting for a modular home. Is that correct? I have not independently verified that number, but it's that your staff has been very good about verifying numbers. Okay. So that would be correct then. And currently there's only one contract out for modulars, I believe. Um, the contract number 19 IFB uh, 015374 DAD. It's awarded to one vendor. There's only one vendor doing those contracts currently. Is that correct? That's correct. And when awarding this contract, isn't it true there's only a single bid that was submitted uh, for these modular contracts? No, sir. Two bids were submitted. Okay, so the second bid you referenced, so they said they couldn't fulfill the requirements and didn't actually submit a bid amount. I believe there was one responsive bidder determined by procurement. And responsive, meaning one bidder who said they could do it and gave you an amount that they could do it for, correct? Yes, and we extended the time frame so that we could try to catch other bidders. But you only ended up with the uh, one bidder, and again, that was for a $38.9 million, $38 million contract at $142 uh, dollars per square foot. Is that correct? There are varying dollar figures in that contract, but yes, that is one of them. And um, now, isn't it true that in March of 2002, seven months after awarding this contract, uh, they requested an increase of 18 uh, percent? not to exceed amount by $7 million and were awarded an additional $7 million to perform that contract? So the contract it defines what we will pay per square foot. The contractor was able to show to us that she was not able to get the units at the dollar square foot that we had signed for, so we went through procurement and legal and gave an increase to get the homes ordered. So the total new contract then is $45.9 million, is that right? That sounds right. And now isn't it true that at the time of granting that prize the vendor had completed only one modular home under its contract and that was almost six months after the contract um, began i am not certain of that number no and uh your office again in august extended the contract for another year uh, despite the vendor only completing six homes during that time period is that correct 
Yes, during that time period, all of the plans had gone through engineering and were starting to be produced. So since the signing of that modular contract 16 months ago, they've only completed 11 modular homes. Is that right? They have a number of scheduled completions for December and many more in January. How many more in January? I will get that number to you. And that's in the future? Yes. Okay. There are, now that the production has picked up and now that the factories are producing those units, the production is going to run at 20 to 30 a month, ideally. Now, the commission staff, we sent a um, request for estimated delivery timelines for the remaining 512 modular homes. Uh, in the response received, in core staff were only able to estimate delivery time frame for 61 of the 512 homes. That's only about 12 percent. Is that correct? That sounds right. So it's correct that your staff cannot provide an estimate uh, when the other 450 families who were selected for modular homes would be completed. Is that right? It depends on permitting and production from the modular factory. We are doing our best to forecast as we can. And again, that's 450 families. You can't tell when they're going to have the modular home, though, correct? We can tell them that we have picked up production, that we are pushing the permits in every instance. And, and those are good things to keep them strung along and give them some kind of answer without giving them the real answer because you can't give them the real answer. Is that correct? The real answer is tied up in manufacturing. And so, you, so we are pushing as hard as we can, okay. yes, sir. So you can't give it. Thank you. Due to the contract that you've signed, we currently have an we don't have an alternate vendor that can do the uh, 250 modular homes, right? Is that correct? Not at this time, no. And uh, per Encore's contract with the modular contractor, there are numerous clauses that give Encore access to the uh, records and documents related to these contracts. Is it true that the Encore representatives have requested these subcontracts between the modular general contractors and the subcontractors, the factories who produce, such as Champion Mobile Homes in Robinson County, that produce the modular home units for the general contractor? Um, have, have any of these been made available to Encore from the uh, prime contractor? No, sir. Now, did the vendor meet their contractual obligations and provide those documents? They are, not con they are not required to provide them to us. We are required to hold them accountable. They are required to hold their sub-recipients accountable, their subcontracts accountable, excuse me. It, now, did Encore push back and demand uh, information on these contracts after they refused to provide that information? As a courtesy to your staff, I made a personal request. But you still don't have access to those records, is that right? No, and I do not have the right to demand them. So basically everything you know about the numbers is based simply on your trust that you're putting in the vendor and their estimate on when these things are going to be done and no actual documentation provided by the vendor to show when these things are going to be done or when the contract is going to be complied with. So we meet with that vendor every, every week. I talk with that vendor multiple times a week. What we know is how many permits they've put in, how many, can be, how many have been approved to that point, and then what the schedule is for coming offline the factory. And then we make sure that those get to the families that are in need the most. Now, is there any way to seek liquidated damages against this contractor for not complying with the terms of the contract and not doing what they should be doing? I am familiar with the liquidated, the liquidated damages clauses in our normal contracts. This is a pilot program, so I am less immediately familiar with the liquidated damages in that contract. So you, you, this program has been in effect since August of 21, is that right? That's right. And you're not familiar with the liquidated damages clause, which is how you hold somebody responsible for not doing what they're supposed to do. I am familiar with that clause in all of our other contracts. Because this is a pilot project, I am not certain about answering that question right now, but I can get back to you. But it's a pilot project that's been in effect for over a year. Yes, sir. And you're the head of Encore. I am. And you, you believe you should be ultimately responsible for uh, these folks not being in their home on Christmas Day right. uh, in a few weeks. Yes. And, you know, I. I mean, I said last time, I mean, I think the job that, that Encore has done has been unacceptable. I think your job has been, uh, if you were in the private sector, I don't know any employer that would keep you employed 
with all the failures that you've allowed to happen. Now, if you've pushed something up to the top and the top has not done something about it, then please tell this committee. But for you not to know what's been going on in this state, or for you to continue to allow the failures to happen and not take steps to change the process until we came here to this committee is a failure. And you failed as a director, you should resign from your position. But if you were in the private sector, you would have been fired a long time ago. Um, again, I just, I, I think that everything that you're, uh, you're doing now is, is kind of lackluster. You're making up or trying to make up for the last several years of folks uh, living in hotels. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's great that you're trying, and I know you say we're trending in the right direction, but, you know, when, when you're out deer hunting and you're waiting on a deer to move in and, you know, eventually that sun sets and sometimes that deer just doesn't move close enough and that sun sets and your time's up. Well, you know what, our time's going to be up on this money if we sit here waiting on things to trend in the right direction whenever you continue to fail. So, nothing further, Madam, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Brett. Senator Jarvis, you were recognized for a series of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Director Hogshead, I just wanted to ask, at our last meeting, um, I asked you and Mr. Duncan to provide specific information at the number of homes that would be completed by the end of the year. Do you recall that conversation? I do, and I cannot give you a specific number because so much is in the hands of the permitting officials, the inspections, and the weather. But okay. I, I did commit to you, and I continue to commit to you, that we will push for every single home. Just, just so, because you don't remember that conversation, let me just enlighten you. Mr. Duncan said, we're trying to get the most homes built before the end of the year. And Senator Jarvis said, so 50 homes, is that 30 days? I'm looking for a time. I want to know a time. Ms. Hogshead. So we awarded a package, 54 MHUs, on June 29th. We had a 60 day, 65 day requirement for that procurement. So those homes are in the general contractor's hands. They are now working through the demo and are now working through elevation. Those 54 families will be home in the months of September and October. Are we in December now? A number of those folks have gone home. A number. So 54. How many out of 54 are home? I can follow up with that number from that specific bid package. Okay. That, the, the bid package I'm referencing, just so you have the documentation, it's 19-IBF446351328-2. Um, and this is after you had enacted stricter implementation in order to get people home more quickly. Is that correct? It is, sir, but if the county will not issue a permit or if there is an easement problem or if there is a property dispute between neighbors, I cannot solve that. I can work with the counties. I can work with the homeowners. Ultimately, some things we cannot force. Okay, so let's, let's just talk a little bit about that. Um, you've got steps one through five that you go through that are paperwork, correct? That's correct. So during those steps, do you have a survey done on the property? We have a survey done at the point that we are ready for construction. At the point you're ready for construction. We take a look at the lot. We do an environmental survey in step four to make sure that there are no hazards, to make sure that the lot is not impeded in any way. But until you get to that zoning permit, there are some things that, you know, county laws have changed, state, town laws have changed, ordinances have changed all the time. You can't be sure until you put that permit in. So. At that time, you verify that the owner is the owner of the property as well? We do. Do you verify zoning setback requirements? At the point of permit, yes. Why would you wait until the point of permit? Why would you wait? This is paperwork that needs to be done prior to going in to get a permit. 
until we are sure what home the, the applicant is going to receive, we cannot calculate the easements. We cannot calculate what is going to happen on that lot. But we do have notes in our system from the environmental review. We note if it is a, a very small lot. We note if it is septic and well. We note where we're going to have to work around septic lines, well lines, et cetera. But until you get to that county telling you whether or not they are going to allow you to place that home on that lot, you can't know all of that until you pull that permit. So it looks like to me, during the process of going through the paperwork, you would identify these issues before you get to permitting. You would meet with the zoning department. You would meet with the, um, to find out the environmental health, septics. You've got to be 50 foot from a well. Uh, if the septic only is acceptable of a three bedroom home, you can't put a four bedroom home in there. I, I remember last time we had discussion about a property that would not fit on the lot. This would have been eliminated had they, these processes been in place. I understand later that, that that home was double the size of what house that was originally on the lot. Is that correct? I don't know the specific instance that you're speaking of, but when we calculate what a family is eligible for, we calculate for the family's current size. They may have been, they may have grown in size, they may have outgrown their home. They, we cannot intentionally use federal funds to intentionally overcrowd a family. So we award them what it's going to take to house that family safely. So we're not interested in putting the family back in their home. We're interested in making the home larger if they say they've got another child or somebody else living in the home, I would, I would think, I don't know how that's not a misappropriation of funds to go in and give someone a larger home unless you're just looking at a mobile home that you can get for less cost to put in there. You don't add bedrooms, you don't add this. This is a hurricane relief, an issue of a problem that occurred based on a hurricane. So if you are asking that I go back to HUD and state that we are only going to give a family the number of bedrooms and bathrooms that they had before, I can go back and make that request. We are very careful not to intentionally overcrowd a family. We don't want a family of six in a two bedroom house. So in, in going back to the homes that we said we'd have 54 of those people back in their homes, um, it's my understanding that as of December the 9th, only five of those units and those people are back in their homes. I will have to verify that. I have pushed for every single one of those permits personally. Okay. And in, in tying back to what Cinder Britt required was, was liquidated damages. So if only, if they've not provided the 54 homes, none of those have been accessed any liquidated damages. If they can tell us what, we have a very rigorous process for them to tell us what the delay is. If there's a materials delay, if there's a weather delay, if they couldn't get the permit, oftentimes it's that they couldn't get the permit through no fault of their own. They have put in the application, permit offices are overloaded. If they can't get the permit, that's a reasonable reason for an extension. We always know what the reason is for the extension. If they're just not telling us or if there's no reasonable explanation for the extension, we have put our general contractors on notice that we will begin assessing liquidated damages. You have put them on notice? Have, yes. I only put them on notice. Okay. So, Director Hogshead, I'd like to just chat a minute about a couple specific projects. Um, and these specific families that were identified as a part of the Senate GovOps visits. Specifically, I'd like to speak to you about one that is number 3959 and 2832. Are you aware of what projects those are? I am. Okay, both of these projects were rehab projects, is that correct? That's correct. What is the time frame that a general contractor has to complete a rehab project? Without time extensions, it should be 45 days. 45 days to close out? Yes, to, that, to key turnover, yes. Okay. So how many, days has, how many days has passed 
on number 3959. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I know that it is far greater than 45 days. Six, 631 days. 631 days for a rehab project. What, what would the explanation for that be? That is something the general contractor owes to us. We do know that that project is slated to be done by the end of the year, both, both projects that you have mentioned. So 2832, do you know how many days has that project been since, since it started? Not precisely, not off the top of my head. 813 days. Explain how in the world a contractor can reach a 45-day rehab project between April to November of 22 on a project with no holds. How can the project go on for 199 days with no activity reported? This is something that we're seeking from our previous vendor and from the general contractor. So at the point that most of that delay happened, we had a construction manager contract. We are seeking any records that they have, but we are seeking those answers as well. So to go for 199 days without nobody from the department figure that out before now? That was the job of our construction management firm, and so we were overseeing them, yes, but we need to find out more from them, and that's what we're endeavoring to do. You don't have computer programs, software that implements uh, if you've not received any documentation? I thought you were supposed to receive documentation on a weekly or daily basis on what's happening with projects, at least monthly. On active construction, yes. And this is active construction, correct? It should have been. There were either holds that were not disclosed or delays that were not disclosed, but that is what we were trying to find out. So who, who is having the holds put on if NCOR is responsible? You have to remember this was the height of the pandemic. Some of, these co some of these homes were held up just because of labor shortages, but the contractor did not necessarily file the paperwork to tell us what that hold might be. So I'm, I'm looking, and just based on numbers, we're looking at a, a project that originally was a $50,000 project. We've got over $50,000 in hotel bills. Is it, would you say that would be correct? I would say that sounds right. And then you've got pod cost as well to be able to house all their um, stuff. We, help me understand. What's... What, what is the process? What's wrong? So rehabs are some of our hardest projects. I know someone stated that they should be easy. They are some of our hardest projects. It is much easier to replace an MHU or to build a new home, stick built or modular, than it is to rehab a house where you go in and you find more issues than you anticipated. So some of the inspections were not as thorough as we would have liked. Some of them were done in 2018, 2019. And when we send a general contractor in, oftentimes those rehabs get much more complicated and much more expensive than we anticipated from the damage assessment. So going into a rehab, do you have an agent on site that meets with the general contractor before the award is made to go over what is to be done and what is to be bid? Before the award is made to the applicant or to the general contractor? To the general contractor. No, sir. The general contractor is responsible for doing their own look at the property to see what they want to bid. We do not facilitate access to the property because they don't have a right to the property at that point. So, NCOR has already made their own inspection. And a lot of these complicated, some of them are simple things. I've heard numbers of roofs. You know, in, in looking, I've, I've heard roofs is a delay. I've heard asbestos as a delay. I've heard lead-based paint as a delay. Um, these are things that are simple. If you pull up within just a matter of minutes, I pulled up a couple of these projects, and look, the house was built in 19, 1965. If it's built in 1965, you know beyond any shadow of a doubt you've got potential lead and asbestos abatement. 
when you go in and an inspector from Mancor goes in to inspect that, they need to pull up floors at a corner. I've done it for years. Go, go into a roof, you know it's a hurricane issue, so most likely you need to look at the roof. That's number one. That's the first thing. Your question was whether or not we facilitate the, ins the general contractor inspecting the home themselves or walking through the home before they put in a bid. We do not do that, but we do provide the inspection reports and the damage re repair verification and the estimated cost of repair to the general contractor so they can make an, an educated bid. Okay, but, but you provide what needs to be done. We do, understanding that there is always going to be more when you open up a wall. Okay. Well, Director Hoghead, at the last hearing, you testified that no liquidated damage had ever been assessed. That's, That's correct. correct. As of today, have any been assessed? Not as of yet. We have put our general contractors on notice that we will begin to assess liquidated damages now that the major impacts of COVID have eased and we, there are no more extraneous excuses, we are going to start assessing liquidated damages. Clearly in reviewing the two applications we just spoke about, this contractor has failed to perform. Would you agree? Those two contracts are disappointing. That contractor has completed 179 projects. So you have to look at the totality. They have completed more projects than any single contractor in our program. So it's only disappointing. No, it's, it's more than disappointing. It's, I, I want, I'm encouraging you to look at the, at the give and the take. They have a lot of projects. They've completed a lot of projects. These two, I do not have great answers on why it's taken so long. There, there's many times throughout the project that there's 70 days without even anyone showing up, 89 days, and NCOR is not taking any initiative to even get in touch with them, go meet with them, find out what the problem is. Um, why in this case have damages not been assessed against this general contractor? We've put them on notice that we will start assessing. So. When were they put on notice? This week. This week? Yes. Just before this meeting? Yes. Why were they not put on before this? We've had a number of conversations about how to do the liquidated damages, how to, how to comply with HUD's financial system with liquidated damages. We've had to seek some general technical assistance from HUD. There is a complicated reporting system with HUD that if you withhold funds from a general contractor, HUD doesn't complete, doesn't consider the contract to be complete. It is a technicality, but we've had to work through HUD with that, and we've worked with other grantees, states, to figure out best practices to make sure that we can do this, and we won't spend all of our time in litigation, that we can do this cleanly, and that we can do it going forward. So at the last hearing, you stated, these are my decisions. These are my staffing decisions. These are my policy decisions and that to me is that still a true statement it is so i'm going to ask you just point blank and i'll remember you know i'll remind you you're under oath but currently has this always been that you have the final say as whether liquidated damages are assessed to the program or not I am not an attorney, and I am not a, f a chief financial officer. I cannot assess them on my own. Of course, there are conversations that happen with the attorneys that would need to represent us and with the finance folks that would need to move the funds. So it is not completely within my hands, but it, we have had those conversations. What I'm telling you is that we are having those conversations and have had those conversations for a while. So the ultimate authority is not with you, even though you have taken full responsibility. I will tell you that I, as a person, do not know how to properly assess liquidated damages without getting sued. So I have to seek the counsel of lawyers and those around me to make sure that we do it properly. I do, it does not help this program for us to get tied up in litigation. So when I told you that the decisions that I make are about what speeds this program up and what slows this program down, spending a lot of time in court is not going to speed this program up. So has anyone, let me be a little more clear maybe, has anyone outside of NCOR say DPS, the governor's office, do they have any say on whether or not 
the access to liquidated damages can be assessed? I discuss decisions with my chain of command as I am, as I need to, as I am ordered to, as I need to run this program. We have to consider the use of time, of everyone's time. Is it better to spend a lot of time spent in court talk, arguing about $250 a day, or is it better to get folks into their homes? I think my time is better spent getting folks into their homes and getting permits and getting general contractors to respond. So ha has anyone, just simple yes or no, has anyone other DPS, governor's office, has anyone been in touch to say not to implement liquidated damages? It has been an ongoing conversation, and at any given moment, the pros and cons have to be weighed about what, what is worth, what is the highest and best use of our time, and what moves applications forward faster. So no one from the governor's office has contacted you or any liaison to not levy liquidated damages? So I would say generally in issues of litigation or potential litigation, we have a number of parties that we have to consult with. We know from experience as an agency, from our experience with the HOPE program, et cetera, there is a limited bandwidth on attorney time and you have to use it appropriately. I think it is far better use of my time to get the permits done and to get the general contractors working than it is to spend time in court. So you don't feel like that there's any reason to hold anybody accountable when they do not do their work to try to, you know, facilitate the fact that they will do their work? I'm not sure I understand your question, but I am always in favor of holding people accountable. Okay, if you hold people accountable, that's what liquidated damages are. Mm -hmm. They're holding contractors accountable. We build roads every day, transportation, there's liquidated damages. Projects are let from cities, counties, all over this state, state contract, liquidated damages are assessed. That holds them accountable. It does, but it also, uh, let's just take a little more nuanced view of this. If I'm a general contractor with several million dollars on the line, some of our contracts are at 100, assessed at $100 a day, some of them are at $250 a day. I want those older projects to be done. Depending on the size of the general contractor and the risk appetite, they might be willing to take a $10,000 hit or to take a $15,000 hit in order to go after the easier project. I want these difficult projects, the ones that have been in process the longest, to be completed. And so that is, that is a balancing of liquidated damages versus so time spent in a courtroom or time spent assessing versus getting out there and swinging hammers. But yet you've never even practiced or, or tested it to see if it would work. It has always been in our contracts. It has always been an option for us. It has always been hanging over the general contractor's heads. One of the other ways that we hold them accountable is we do vendor complaint letters, which lowers their scorecard and reduces their opportunity to bid with us. But you have never tested it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Jarvis. Uh, for folks that are with us, so you will know, the chair does not intend to take a lunch break. So if you need to step out, feel free to do so. But we're going to continue the questioning and on to the uh, next testimony after the director. This time, I'd like to recognize Senator Waddell for a series of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank you, Director, for the information that you've provided. I have just a couple of questions. Is there anything that this General Assembly can do to assist in what you're doing to make this process any better? Yes, ma'am. There are a few things that we have talked about with staff and with several members that could potentially speed the program up. We are looking at best practices across the country. We are looking at what, is, what was described at the last hearing in South Carolina is not possible under North Carolina state laws, and so we're looking at that model and seeing if it will benefit us. But engaging with St. Bernard Project, making sure that we are getting the best examples and coming to you with a concrete ask. Okay, second question. When you think about the pace in the last three months, um, and you've talked a little bit about that, so is the pace that NARCA has reached in the last three months, do you see that as being sustainable? I see it as being sustainable and I see us growing from there, yes. Okay, as you think about that and you talked about some changes, could you speak specifically a little bit more about the impact that you think these changes that you've made will be successful? 
Yes, ma'am. So one of the main changes that we made was to our procurement process. And we started opening up our procurement process to any general contractor that wanted to participate, not just the general contractors on our pre-qualified list, because that list had dwindled during the housing boom of the last couple of years. And we also made a change that general contractors could select amongst the large package that we put out, whether or not they wanted to do one project, five projects, or 100 projects. That has encouraged smaller general contractors to get their foot in the door with us, to test us out, for us to test them out. And ultimately, it comes down to how many general contractors we have working on this program. Paying them faster has helped as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Senator Devier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A series of questions, if I may. You're welcome, ask. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Director Hogshead, uh, good to see you this morning or this afternoon now. Thank you for once again taking accountability as you did at the last hearing. Um, I personally appreciate that and expect that from our leaders. Um, I know we all share a desire to continue to get people back in their homes. I want to go back to a couple things before I ask some new questions. One that Senator Britt uh, mentioned just as a follow-up on the module home contractors. So you said you don't have the right to ask for information um, under the contract. Uh, I don't have the right to demand it. Correct. I you don't have the right to demand it. But do you have the right to terminate the contract? I do. There is a termination clause. Okay. And then going back to the last hearing, one of the questions that I brought up was about what I call per diem dollars. Forgive the it's a military mm -hmm. kind of lingo mm -hmm. for me. Um, but to offset the cost of you know, dislocation from homes for things like cooking food and a hotel room and, and just those additional costs. Is there any update on looking at funding uh, outside of the TRA? So HUD won't let us send checks to applicants, right? They won't let us pay for per diem, to use your phrase. But the ultimate answer is to get people out of those situations faster. We understand that it is a hardship to be out of your home. The ultimate solution is to get you through construction and back to your home faster. And I can't agree with you more we need to get people back in their homes but in many times as we've as we've discussed before these people are low income fixed income yes um, and in some cases used savings um, used loans from their family friends to be able to offset some of these costs so my hope um, and hope's a bad word to use sometimes um, is that we're continuing to look at funding sources across the state um, or federally that we could offset these dollars and maybe recoup uh, some of these dollars that have been spent especially for people that have been in their hotels for over two years yes sir we are always looking and we are always referring applicants to other organizations that might be able to help great of the 18 families that you reported earlier have returned to homes and that you mentioned to Senator Perry I've got one of those homes as you know we've talked about it um, in my district, the Adams home. Yes. Um, I personally visited it as well as others in my district um, multiple times um, to look at the progress and kind of see at the Adams home is one that took back possession. Right. But what I saw, and, and this isn't a, a new conversation, so you and I have talked about this before, um, is just not quality workmanship and, and things that were not done that would not pass a home inspection if somebody was going to get a loan on their home um, but my concern in seeing that and talking to others and reading some of the, the, the constituent uh, comments that were made today or to our, to our committee is that some people feel like they don't have any other options, that they're pressured to take the home, they don't have a voice, they're stuck in a hotel, they're going to lose their TRA, they've got to take the home and it's uh, in whatever form is given to them. And in some cases I've seen windows incorrect, wall sockets wrong, floors uneven, ability for water to come back into a home. So I guess I'm, I want you, and we've talked a little bit about it, but explain what recourse a homeowner has once they take possession. Yes, thank you for giving the opportunity to talk about this. So every home comes with a warranty, a one-year workmanship warranty, two-year systems warranty, and 10-year structural warranty. We want applicants to let us know if there is a problem. If they call us and let us know that there's a problem, we'll send our state inspector out to look at that problem, make sure it's within the scope, and then we work with the general contractor to get them back out there to correct whatever needs to be corrected. We are also working, we have signed a number of MOUs with VOADs who are also willing to come in and do some of those later repairs if they need to be done. So 
how are those cases tracked? Are they going back into your case management yes. system to be able to be tracked that then maybe legal aid would eventually get access to to be able to have some accountability? Because my concern is we're very focused, as you can hear, on getting people back in their homes. What, I, what I'm concerned about is actually letting them live in their home, mm -hmm. um, the proper home. We want them to be happy with their home, and if there are warranty issues, we want those addressed. That's what's in our contract with the general contractor. We will make them go back as many times as it takes. We are also looking at whether other states have had more success with a third-party warranty, which might remove you know, the general contractor that you might not want to see again from the equation. So we're looking at any improvement we can make there. But they are tracked through our system. They do get contact from a construction liaison. So it's going back into the case management system so that it can be tracked. Yes. So if there is contact and the constituent is reaching out to legal aid for help, it's going to be documented in the system. And we're going to yes. see a year from now or two years from now those issues if they're reported. Absolutely. And, we're, edu okay. and we're also educating the homeowners um, and our constituents on that process. We are. Um, last meeting, you talked about uh, the agency. We talked about things that we could, the legislature could help you with. Um, we talked about the needing to ability to contract at a higher rate than the 30K. Forgive me if the terminology yes. is wrong. Um, and the 30K threshold. And you talked about moving more like a business than and less like government. Has there been any movement on that? And are, are you still... It, are there still hurdles? I know we are kind of in session, but kind of not. But I would event if we need to do something, I would assume that it would be done in the long session next year from a statute standpoint. But are there things within uh, that can be done uh, without legislative action? That is an ongoing conversation with your staff, and we are working with Department of Administration and your staff to to figure out what can be done administratively, figure out what needs to be done legislatively, make sure we're all on the same page, and then implement the change that needs to happen. Because there's some higher levels at the federal limit, at the federal level, correct? Yes, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay, and that would hopefully speed up the process um, for contracting, et cetera. It, yes, it has in other states. We're watching carefully to make sure that the appropriate guardrails are put in place and that we use the best practices from other states. Mr. Chairman, if you one last question, um, you know, I, I also understand that sometimes I heard you say a lot of today permitting and inspection and things that are happening. Um, I understand that there's sometimes a backlog. We see backlogs at different phases of this process. Uh, there potentially are backlogs at the county level um, for things like permitting and inspection. And let's look at the area that this is really impacting at small rural areas. Right. Um, I would venture to say that, you know, some of the districts that we represent, those resources in that county are small when it comes to permitting and inspecting um, and the ability to get them out. Um, have we looked in any ways to coordinate directly with that local agency or provide them resources? I look at some of these counties that you heard Senator Jackson talk about, and I know they have very, they probably have one person, if a half a person, doing inspecting and permitting. That's right. Have we looked at any resources or ways to collaborate with our counties to speed this up and eliminate this backlog? I know I personally got involved in one of them and had a conversation with our county manager, uh, and we have a larger staff than I know some of these counties do. Yes, sir, and I appreciate all the help that I've received from you all. I have called you all, almost all of you, for permit help and have received it, and I appreciate that. The counties are overwhelmed by the number of permits and the number of inspections that we require. So on the inspection side, I feel we have a solution where we, NCOR has a longstanding memorandum of agreement with the Department of Insurance. Department of Insurance then enters into agreements with the counties to allow Department of Insurance inspectors to do the inspection in the county, to stamp it, to sign it, to submit it. So that that takes the work entirely off of the county inspector who might be busy working on other projects, who might be working on HMGP or private sector projects. Not all counties have signed that agreement yet. We are encouraging all county managers to sign. It's a free resource for the county. And so we are working to get more counties to participate in that. On the permitting side, we are talking with counties about hiring more staff and how to support them for this influx. And, and understandably, they're a little nervous because this influx is not going to last forever. So everyone's hesitant to bring on a county employee when you know that the, the volume will decline in a, few, in a few months or a few years. So we're working with them to see how we can flex that arrangement and how we can support that. And when you say support, you mean with resources down to a county that yes. probably has a very, very small budget. Yes. You can provide it in a grant resource, much like the federal grants are coming down to you and your agency will probably go away once those federal grants go away. Exactly, but the county has to agree. This is their jurisdiction and we're very careful about that. Have you, 
is there a coordinated effort with your organization and the county managers specifically in that impacted area where you're having weekly updates or some way that they're informed of what's going on, maybe even plugged into the, I keep coming back to this case management software. Um, technology sometimes a wonderful thing. So they used to have Salesforce access. They weren't largely using it. Salesforce is a complicated tool, as you know. And so what we've, what we've pivoted to is giving them updates. So we will download information and give them updates about the number of homes that are going on in their county, where they stand in the process, answer any questions. That has gotten more formal in the last few months. It, it may be worth talking to the county elected officials, too, much like we're talking to the elected officials here. Yes. Um, maybe another option. Uh, county managers sometimes can get overwhelmed. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That ends my line of questions. And thank you, Ms. Uh, Director Hogshead, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Representative Willingham, you're recognized for a series of questions. Yes, I just have one question. Um, the money that we have right now that you have uh, in this project is quite a bit, but is there any time limit as to when this money has to be spent? Yes, sir. The Hurricane Matthew funds must be spent by 2025, and the Hurricane Florence funds must be spent by 2026. Okay, knowing that, then uh, do you feel like you're on course to be able to do that with the backlog of stuff that we have that you're dealing with? I do. I think that the increase in output and this, the, the sustainability of that increase and then increasing further the projects that we have in the pike coming down the line, I do feel we can finish this. Okay, thank you. Representative Plass, you're recognized. Tough day to be here, isn't it, Director? This is my job, and I'm happy to do it. Thank you. Well, I won't keep you long. Um, I sat back and I, I look at October of 2016, and it was a monumental year for me in a different way from these folks. My son was in boot camp when Matthew came ashore. Uh, they moved him off base, and then as soon as it was safe, they moved him back, and they continued their training. He completed his obligation to the Marine Reserves this summer. So he's got six years in, um, and unfortunately, according to this, there's about 3,000 people that haven't had what we told them, the state of North Carolina told them that we would do to help them return to their homes. And it's disturbing. I keep hearing a lot of things have changed. Uh, I look at your experience and a lot of the things in your resume are helping folks. It's, it's under someone else's responsibility, and this looks like this is the first time that you have been the person in charge. You've always been helping other folks accomplish tasks. You've had three years. Um, doesn't seem like there's a lot of movement, but Tropical Storm Fred hit in August of last year. And recently there was 7.9 million that's been appropriated to go to the folks up there. What have you learned to help make sure that this isn't repeated? Yes, sir. Well, as we discussed in Hurricane, I'm sorry, in Tropical Storm Fred, we were not expecting that allocation from HUD. That $7.9 million was a surprise. And as I said to you, there's $5 million that they have decided to allocate to Tropical Storm Fred on top of that $7.9 million. Because our money comes in so late, we have to take a look at the landscape and see what else is already operating. OSBMDR is doing a fantastic job on the ground in Haywood County and in other places that were affected by Tropical Storm Fred. So our funds are being channeled in a different way towards building more affordable housing because that is what your local communities told us they, they would prefer. But it is a conversation because our funds come so late to the game, we wanna make sure that we're having, that we're providing the recovery that the community wants. In the case of Matthew and Florence, there was no overwhelming program to take applications at the time that we were stood up. So you think that the changes to the application process is going to prevent where we are today? I know this was overwhelming just, just in conversations that I've observed and had that this particular Matthew and Florence was very devastating to the state of North Carolina. It was a large area. But you think by changing the way you're doing the application and moving things forward that we're not going to see this repeated? So we're not doing the exact same thing in, 
Haywood County that we are doing in Eastern North Carolina. In Eastern North Carolina, we have a 50 county geography of impacted folks, thousands of folks impacted. Again, our money came in after, far after the fact. We got our Florence money in 2020. But in Tropical Storm Fred, most of your individual applicants have already made an application to OSBMDR. And so what we are doing is, is doing a subrecipient agreement with the county and a nonprofit to build affordable housing, not to take individual applications. So it's not the same program that we are running in Eastern North Carolina. Colonel Sanderson was quite impressive whenever he came and addressed us the last time. Is he going to be involved in anything in the mountains or? Not to my knowledge. Know? Not to my knowledge, but he works for a nonprofit that consults on any disaster recovery. So he's available to help if, if he was approached and would choose to help. He is available. Has he talked to anybody as far as helping the state of North Carolina at this point? On Hurricane Florence and Matthew Recovery, yes. We have engaged him and his staff. We have sent our staff to talk with his staff extensively. We are working with him. But if you're talking about Tropical, tropical Storm Fred, we have not engaged him on Tropical Storm Fred. Okay, so he's been engaged in the current problem, but that's, that's right. the ones in the mountains he's not been engaged in yet. Okay. Um, how do we help you move forward? I guess there's always problems. There, there's always uh, the ability to uh, correct a course. How, how do we correct a course? I'm not sure that so far everything that I've heard today, I haven't really seen or heard a lot of movement that's gonna change what's happening. Uh, I view my job as representing the people, but also making the connections so that government works for the people. And it doesn't look like this portion of it is working. So how do we help? There are a few very informal ways and a, fair, a few very formal ways. So we will have, as I've said, a legislative list of concrete asks for you, but informally we need more general contractors and we need you to encourage any general contractors that you know to work with us to dispel any of those myths that it takes too long to pay or it's too much paperwork. We have worked to reduce all of those barriers. This comes down to how many general contractors we have working on projects at any given time. And so one of you have vast resources, vast networks. We need for folks to understand that this is a program that can work for a general contractor and can work for a homeowner. So the list that you're going to have that we can help with, is it going to be specific to the General Assembly needs to do this, the yes. governor needs to do this, the secretary of the department needs to do this? Are you going to make it to where everyone knows their role and can look at the things that are going to help you along? I can certainly do that. We are preparing a list of legislative requests. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Representative Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I do have a series of questions. You're recognized. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I did a little bit of math here, and, and again, help me if I can. Um, in, the, in the TRA applicants, we have 115. Now, some of them are moving out this month, is that correct? Those are 115 that your staff captured in a, in a snapshot as in TRA for more than a year as of September 14th. We have a few that shouldn't be in that number, but around 115 that have been in TRA for more than a year. How many are in TRA, period? Overall, 333 people are in TRA, most of them for, for short periods of time. 330. As of the last three months, how many are in TRA? As of today, it's 333. When you have 250 construction projects going on where most of the folks need to leave their homes, it's reasonable that that number of people would be in TRA, plus some of the folks that are working through older projects. And it's costing us $500,000 a month just to provide housing for these people? I have not verified that number, but that is a number that has been shared. <laughs> I, I, I thought that's what you were verifying with Senator Jackson. Um, NCOR is housed at Department of Public Safety, and, and, and you are a limited funding, limited time. So what's been the level of involvement with DPS? What, what do they do with you and for you? We have a high level of involvement with DPS. I report to the Chief of Staff weekly. We give dashboards uh, every other week to the Secretary and to the Chief of Staff and others. Do they have any, any comments or... Um, ability to talk or deal with you on outcomes? Do they start looking at outcomes and, and make expectations from you? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, and what kind of support and assistance have they provided to you? 
So as an entity of DPS, they support our HR functions. They help us with the finance back, out, back office functions, everything they would do for a normal independent agency of DPS. So similar to the support that they provide for emergency management or state highway patrol. So, so who do you meet with weekly? And the share chief of your staff. Numbers? The chief of staff. The chief of staff, but not Senator, uh, not Secretary Buffalo. I talk with, Chuck, with Secretary Buffalo every other week on the on the regular calls. Okay. Um, and do they ha do they get in your way, or do they help you? Or are, they, are they helping you make progress? They are always willing to do what they need to do to knock down obstacles. I would say this is a very difficult federal program that the state has not administered before, so the obstacles are many. Okay. And you're talking. We we're talking a while ago about legislative fixes. You're just now bringing them forward in spite of four years of difficulty. They're just now coming forward, things that you need fixed. They are conversations that we've had before. The, the window seems to be more open, and so we are going to try to take advantage of that. Well, if I may, who have you asked before to help make these changes? Have you gone to specific legislators? We've gone through the process. You know that there's a process for making an ask. It's not something that I could come knock on your door and ask you. There's a process for making an ask, and we have set forth some of our challenges until until COVID slowed us down, I think it was not as apparent that we needed some of the flexibilities that we are asking for now. Well, well you're talking about COVID, mm -hmm. and you mentioned COVID several times, and that COVID was not an appropriate time to ask. But during COVID, weren't construction workers exempt, considered essential employees, people who needed to continue to work? Absolutely, but they were not working with us. So we put out six or eight procurement packages, large procurement packages in a row that received absolutely no bids. No one wanted to deal with a state program or a federal program when the private sector was booming and was paying cash. And what was your process for asking for any kind of legislative change or legislative exemption? What process do you have to go through? There is a process for every agency to make legislative requests. What is your process? I have to bring it to all of my, all of my superiors, convince them, and then they can put it forward when, when the window is open again. How, how many superiors do you have? I report to the chief of staff. She reports to the secretary. He reports to the governor. Okay, so you got three that you need to confront, consult with before you come to the legislature. You can't come to us directly is what you're telling us. Yes, and it has to be weighed with everything else that DPS needs. Now, during COVID, we, we loosened a lot of restrictions to keep things moving. Right. And this was a particularly important process, but you didn't come to us or your governing bodies didn't, the governor, the secretary, the chief staff, nobody came and said, we have this problem that's affecting us getting hurricane victims back in their home. I am not aware of anything you could have done to make general contractors work with us. Um, I understand, but could we have eased the process of some of the things you're asking for now, and that is the, raising the $30,000 threshold, um, helping you with permitting, I mean, we were the ones who established a process that inspectors from the Department of Insurance can come out. We could have done something more with permitting if that's a problem we knew about. And those were critical things. Even during COVID, they were even more critical because you didn't have people in housing. And you're spending a half a million dollars a month temporarily housing these people in a very expensive process. So, so I'm, I'm a little confused as to how you or your superiors did not find it appropriate when we were doing everything for everybody else. Everything from notary publics, uh, being able to do e-notaries to keep the real estate market moving. We, we did all kinds of things to help people during COVID. So I don't understand why you didn't come to us and now say COVID was your excuse. We have talked for years about how to administer this program effectively, being that it is a federal program with federal guidelines. There is just not much you can change about the federal government's guidelines. I, if I had known that COVID was going to go on as long as it did, I think, I, as I've said before, I would have made some different decisions and come earlier. Okay. And so since the last hearing, who have you communicated specific legislative fixes to? I have talked with my bosses about them, and they are being, they are being gathered, but we are also seeking the input of experts across the country so that we don't miss anything that we need to ask for. You are housed at Department of, the Department of Public Safety. But you are an independent body, is that right? I am an agency of DPS. I am an agency within DPS. An agency within DPS. Okay. 
And so what kind of flexibilities have you sought from DPS? We are an odd fit for anyone. We are a staff of receipt-supported positions that will go away at the end of this project, as you've noted. And so we are always pushing against any flexibilities that we believe that you all want us to have that we need to have to be successful. They have supported all of the exemptions, all of the faster hiring timeframes. We knock on their door a lot and ask for a lot. So, but for, but for this hearing process today, you, do, you were not able to tell us your concerns or problems and felt like you were not able to communicate directly with us. Everything had to go through your superiors. I would not put it quite that way. There is a process for any cabinet level agency to make a request of the legislature. But, and, and, and I guess that's what I'm getting to. If you found these needs to be critical, why didn't you bring them directly to us? There is always a process for making requests, whether it's through the, the governor's budget or otherwise. Now you have asked me for this list. I am preparing the best list that I can put forth to you with the assistance of experts across the country. So this hearing was critical to help resolve your problems. This hearing has been helpful in terms of transparency and in making sure that everyone understands the situation that we are in now and how to fix it going forward. What's been the level of involvement from the governor's office? They've been very involved. What specifically have they done to support and assist you? There is a lot of accountability for us and the governor's office. Uh, for the first three years, we work, we met weekly. Now we meet biweekly. We provide a dashboard at each of those each of those meetings that shows the numbers. They are always asking us what we need. So much of this is federal that I can't get, even the governor's office can't change HUD's mind on duplication of benefits. They just can't. And so there is not a lot that the governor's office can do, but they are offering the support that they can offer. Again, you express concerns that we can deal with on a state level. Opening up some bidding processes, doing some things with a $30,000 bidding threshold. And in your discussions with the governor, was the Department of Public Safety Secretary Ruffalo included in those or his chief of staff? Yes, we always have conversations okay. together. And with them all together, we didn't identify these problems and say, legislature, can you fix them two years ago? I did not come forward and ask for a raising of the threshold. We have talked about it internally and whether or not that would solve our problem. Now we are making the request. It would have assisted your problem back then even, wouldn't it? It may have, it may not have. That's what we're talking to experts across the country, okay. because even if you have the raised assignment threshold, you have to have so many federal parameters around it that we want to make sure that that's the most useful tool. Okay. So what regulatory or procedural flexibilities have you sought from the Department of Public Safety or from the governor? I have not put forward a specific list. That is why we engaged St. Bernard Project and the Colonel to help us identify that list. I have not put forward a list that has been shot down. What, I, I'm not saying shot down, but I, I'm just trying to figure out if there's anything that you've requested for flexibility-wise. There is just not much that the state can do to exempt us from HUD's requirements. And believe me, I would ask. Well, you, you said at the hearing in September that Governor Cooper has asked the card questions and helps us change course. How has he specifically helped you change course? We have made a number of difficult decisions in this, in this program, and we have had to talk those decisions through with the governor. Insourcing this contract is a big decision, and he has supported us in that. He understood that it was going to take time to get our staff ramped up and to stop relying on vendors. He supported that. He has offered us HR help. He has offered us whatever we need to make sure that we can be successful. And from September to now, you indicate that you have increased your completions by 242 percent. Are you proud of that number? I see the trajectory and I am encouraged that the trajectory is moving in the right direction. But that's from five completed homes to 17 completed homes a month. Average, you're pleased with that progress? Average per month. We have completed 74 construction projects since September 14th and 26 reimbursement projects since September 14th. So 100 people have moved into step eight since September 14th. How many more people are eligible for the reimbursement program? The reimbursement only program? Yes. Unclear as they get their award letters, we look to see what they're eligible for. So it becomes clear in step five. I do not have that number off the top of my head. Well, I'm looking at, let's see, let's go to step five. And, and the bulk of the people 
I mean, I'm just doing some quick math. More than half are beyond step five. Right. So how many of those are eligible, if you know, for reimbursement? How many have been offered reimbursement? Everyone who is eligible in steps six and seven has been offered. How many have rejected? Uh, do, do you have answers on all of those? They've either accepted yes. or rejected? Yes. yes. Okay. So have you paid out all those who've accepted? To my knowledge, yes. So going forward, there will be less and less people who will do that. You have to get to the construction. Right. You indicated in your forms that 900, let's see, I'm looking for that specific number of how many have been sent out to contractors, have, have gotten a contract or awarded. Um, 970 is what yes. I remember? Let yes, 970. And of those 970, do we have completion dates assigned to the contract? We do not have completion dates built into the contract. Why are completion dates not built into the contract? What is built into the contract is the time frame for the, the specific project that it is. If it's a new construction, it's 108 days. If it's a new construction with elevation, it's a separate dot figure. If it's a rehab, as we've discussed, it's 45 days. If, a, if it's a modular, they have to have it on their lot within 65 days. What we have is a series of constraints around the general contractors built into the contract where they know if they are bidding on a significant number of rehabs, once we hit the clock, hit go on that clock, they have 45 days to either complete or explain to us why they can't complete. Okay. So you sign the contract, but the time doesn't start running until you get to something apparently called a notice to proceed? That's right. How many of these 970 are waiting the notice to proceed? I have that number, but not in front of me. I can get it to you. You got, a, you, you got an estimate? Is it half or more? I don't want to hazard a guess. Once the contractor has the capability to move forward, they ask for the notice to proceed. We push the notices to proceed as quickly as we can. But if we, I'm going to be clear, if we build into the contract, you must complete these homes within X number of days, no one will bid. So this is a balancing act. We have to keep general contractors. We have to keep them working. We cannot scare them off like that. No one is going to sign a contract that says you will be done in 40 days no matter what happens. Even if it takes the county 50 days to give you a permit, even if it rains for 20 days, no one is signing that contract. So this is a balance of how do we get general contractors to work with us and how do we hold them accountable? And that's a balance that we constantly try to strike the as, right one. A, so the question is, you don't like the liquidated damages. How do you hold them accountable? Mostly through vendor complaint letters, which lowers their score. So they have a scorecard based on how many homes they've completed, the workmanship, et cetera. And so we issue vendor complaint letters either for action or not for action, and then that lowers their scorecard and impedes their ability to bid in the future. How many complaint letters have you done? I do not know off the top of my head, but several. Same contractor? Different contractors. Okay. You only have 12. Mm -hmm. So of the 12, how many of you issued letters of complaint to? I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can get it to you. Three? Five? I half? do not know. I do not know. One? I mean, you said no. it's more than one and more than, more, than one, more than one complaint. More I than would one say contract. probably half. I'm if, I'm, if I'm hazarding a guess, I would say half. Half of them you've done letters of complaint because they're not getting the work done? Or there is another issue okay. that violates the contract. So the reimbursement process is a one-time bump, and that, that will not continue as a pace. Right. If we remove those, you're talking about 74 homes in three months. That's right. Okay. Um, and the first time you ask us for a change in law about assignments instead of taking existing authority, it, well, you ask us about raising the threshold, $30,000, that that mm -hmm. would be helpful. Yes. But when you were here in September, we started talking about there's a law on assignments instead of taking, you have some existing authority through the Department of Administration already in statute. Have you been taking advantage of that? We've been having very serious conversations about what they are comfortable administering and what, they, what will be backed up by the legislature. And do you know how many projects you could assign out under the $30,000 threshold? Every project that we can assign out under $30,000, we do. Well. Unless, I'm sorry, it, let me put one caveat on that. Unless there is no general contractor that will take it. So we offer them, but if there's no general contractor that wants to work in that area or wants to work on that project, if we have no takers, we have no one to assign it to. Okay. You've talked about problems with <coughs> permitting. What are the problems and where are they? 
are you, are you saying there's office backup? I mean, we, we'd like to specifically, I think, know about what counties are, are giving you a problem with backup on permitting. I've heard one of the problems with permitting is that it has to be in somebody's name and that if you've changed the mobile home, you've got to contact them personally in order to get them to change the modular home structure that they want and that there's some difficulty in doing that. You tell me what's your problem. I'm not sure I follow. I'm not sure I follow that last, okay. that last argument. Well, but I can look into it. Um, it is simply volume. It is. It is volume. If we put out a package like I signed right after the last hearing, I signed a package of 153 manufactured housing units. What we encourage general contractors to do is to go ahead and put in all the permits so that we know where there's going to be a problem. If there's a zoning issue, if there's a neighbor dispute, if someone hasn't paid their taxes, we want to know that up front so that we can appropriately shift the resources and make sure that the, the homes are going to the people who are ready to receive them. Even though those, the general contractors did what they were supposed to do and put in those permits, a handful have been received and they put them in in early October. So the, it is simply volume, as, what, as I understand. There are some communities that are nervous because of all of this. They don't want to make a mistake, so they take an extra long time to review our permits. I get that. But we are offering them. We do visits with them. We explain. We do 101s. We try to make them as comfortable as we can. But ultimately, it just comes down to putting 153 permits on a county person's lap in a week. But it's, it's 150 permits to various counties. It's to various counties, but each project can have up to four. So you might have a demo permit, a zoning permit, an environmental health permit, and a building permit. And then if you've got to pull electrical or plumbing, there are multiple permits. So when I talk about projects, 153 projects, it's actually much more than 153 permits because each project can have four or five permits associated with it, particularly with that MHU package where they are all new MHUs. I think that's some of what the staff's going to ask you for our next meeting is which counties are you having permitting process and what kind of permits are the problems. We'd like to see you get this thing done. We want these people back in their homes. So we're looking to see what we can help you with. Um, so now what have you done to engage local contractors that can work under that threshold and what threshold if we went to 40,000, how much more will that help you? Where, where can we get more involvement from the locals? So I have personally had conversations with all of the counties, with the towns where that is appropriate, where the permitting is done by the town or the city. I have engaged in terms of getting more general contractors. Me and my staff have engaged the North Carolina General, Li general Contractor Licensing Board. We have contacted um, any of the associations that will that will listen about putting out more information. We've put in ads in their newspapers. We've put out ads in their newsletters, making sure that they know that this is an option and that coming in under that assignment threshold is a good way to get started. So if you're a small GC, you're not too sure about how you want to start, you don't have to come in on a 100-unit package. You can come in with an assignment. And we get interest all the time. Our construction team talks to the general contractors, explains the process to them. And we start them small, so we start them out with those assignments. The, the did the first statement I hear from you that you actively involve yourself in the permitting process? If I need to, I do. Okay. And, and where have you, that, that's, I, I'm still trying to find out where we're having the problems with the permitting. And, and so if you've done that, what counties or cities or towns have you had the problems with? It's simply, <laughs> it's simply volume in most places. So I'm not saying that they are not being helpful, but if we dump hundreds of permits in Robeson County, where most of our applicants live, it is going to be slower. And so I have personally talked to Kelly Blue, the county manager. I have talked to their permitting person. And we, have, we are working through trying to streamline as much as possible. They don't have a computer system. So this is a paper-based process. We're trying to figure out how we can assist them with that, whether or not we can give them resources to help them get through these permits. Okay. See, that, that's helpful. If we know where there's a problem, then we may can use some of our resources to, to help that. Um, are there certain decisions or policies, you're, you're telling me that you, you somewhat feel you have your hands tied, are there certain decisions or policies you'd like to make or like to have made but were unable to because of the people you have to answer to? No, there's nothing that I have asked for that the state could control that I have not been able to get. What I wish is that HUD would be more flexible about some of these dollars. What happened with Ivan Duncan? That is a personnel matter that I am not at liberty to discuss. I will say what I have already said, which is that he resigned. And, 
and when you talked about liquid damage, so we talked about liquid damages and we decide not to go through them. Is, is that mostly who, who, who's we? I have to have the support of the folks that would represent me in court. So if we're going to assess liquidated damages, we have to be ready for the consequence. So that's a conversation with a number of parties, but we have now put them on notice that we will be assessing liquidated damages. Who are those parties? That's my question. Is it the AG's office? Is it yeah, legal staff and DPS? Who, who is we? So we have to make some, I, I have not personally consulted the AG's office. I would say we have to make some assumptions about what is worth everyone's time. $250 a day is not going to attract an AG staffer, right? They're not going to, they're probably not going to be able to spend time on that. So we have to make some assumptions about what is reasonable. And I keep saying, who's we? You said we have to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Who's we? You and? Me with DPS legal. I'm sorry. DPS legal. OK. But you get to make the decision with DPS legal's consultation yes. as to whether it's worth it. Yes. Is it worth it with some of these that are a year behind or two years behind to send a message? Absolutely. And that's what we've endeavored to do. And you, you indicate you have looked at other states, how they structure their disaster relief program, yes. and particularly if they're doing it from the federal. Do you have any kind of opinion on whether another structure would be better for North Carolina? I've looked across the landscape, and everyone approaches this a little bit differently. Some folks have their CDBGDR program housed in the Commerce Department, some in the Housing Department, if the state has a Housing Department, some within the Governor's Office. Uh, New York has it housed within the Governor's Office. South Carolina, as Colonel Sanderson said, moved to a commission model. So, it, you know, California, Oregon, others have them embedded within agencies. Others don't. It, there is a mis there is a there is no one recipe to this. But but something's wrong with our system. I think you've acknowledged that something is wrong with our system in terms of getting it moving effectively. So I would not say, I would not go that far. I would say we are, you stood us up to be different. You stood us up to be a receipt supported agency that works itself out of existence. That is not what the state is used to. I'm going to ask you, um, have you been in touch with or talked to or you're aware of uh, information from DSW homes? I am aware of the letter that they sent in support of this hearing. Okay, and is that going to be another resource that you may be able to use? And how expensive are those? Is, is that in that assignment range of 30,000 that you can use? We have assigned a number of projects to them and they have won some procurements. So they were on the pre-qual list with us early on. They have recently come back to work in the state and they have a number of projects assigned. Okay. All right. I, I think that's all at this point. Oh, I'm sorry, one last question. One last right. question. So, <coughs> Chain, your chain of command is DPS and the governor. Who has the authority to decide whether you remain in this job? Do you know, did, I asked that last time. Did, did, did you find an answer? The secretary of DPS, the governor, can fire me. Both of those can? Yes. Okay. Good, good representative? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Senator Perry, I'm going to recognize you for a second time. And after you, sir, that's going to conclude our questions for the director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the, the latitude. Um, so a few things occurred to me while we were sitting here and, and listening to your, your explanations, but also listening to my colleagues on, on some of the problems that we faced. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm given to math and accounting. That, those are the things I, I like. I'm one of those weird people. But whenever I can't get the math to add up, I assume that I'm missing some numbers somewhere. And some of this just isn't adding up to me. I even got on you a little bit about some of the slides and the information. I said, it feels like you polished it up to make it, you know, look better than it is. And um, just so all of you are aware, I, I do not have a contentious relationship with Director Hogshead. Uh, it's an easy relationship. I, I know her to be someone that, my personal opinion, she's very intelligent. And I think about you shining up those slides, and uh, I, I know you knew you'd come in here today and it, it wouldn't be fun. And it, it brings me to more questions. Uh, Senator Britt and Senator Jarvis um, 
they were talking about problems with, with contractors. Senator Jarvis mentioned one who's taken over two years to complete a 45-day rehab without naming the contractor. Is that the same contractor they were discussing with issues? I'm seeing some heads shake out in the audience. Uh, I'm sorry, which They, they which were projects? talking about um, Senator Jarvis referenced a contractor who had taken over two years to compete, compete, complete what was supposed to be a 45-day rehab. Senator Britt was talking about a lot of delays with mobile homes. Um, I think that's the same contractor they were referencing. The modular contractor and the contractor on the two app numbers. Without naming anyone, is that the same? It is the same. It is also the contractor that has completed 179 projects. Hmm. Um, so of the, the families who are in the temporary relocation assistance situation, living in the hotels, are a good percentage of those, I know you don't have the exact number, but a decent percentage of those, are, are they also involved with that same contractor? Not all of them. Some of no, them. No, 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 no. Right. Not all of them, just a number of them. I'm number, seeing a lot of heads bobbing of out there. I'm, I'm thinking of the numbers. A number of them. For, there was a period of time, because we do lowest responsive, responsible bidder, there was a period of time when that contractor won a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. that, that particular vendor has completed the most projects and also has the most projects. Is it true that you have reassigned some of their prior awards to other contractors? Yes. Okay, so it, it again, um, you know, I'm just a small town lawmaker, but it appears to me that we're seeing a trend of a lot of problems uh, in, in one area. I, I know you were asked about a document sharing clause, and I know that uh, there's a standard from the Department of Administration as required by North Carolina law to, um, you know, there, there's, we see um, information sharing or document sharing, I think records and access clauses in agreements, um, as is, is typical. And that comes from North Carolina General Statute 143-49, paragraph 9. And it says to include a standard clause in all contracts awarded by the state and departments, agencies, institutions of the state, providing that the state auditor, internal auditors of the affected departments, agency, or institutions may audit the records of the contractor during and after the term of a contract to verify accounts and data affecting fees or performance. I also have a memo dated August 31 from the Department, North Carolina Department of Public Safety comes from Matt Arlen, the chief, I guess I'm pronouncing that right, chief recovery officer. And it's to a vendor and he references uh, access to information, access to records, maintenance of records, NCOR and Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Comptroller of the United States, or any of their duly authorized representatives shall have access to books, documents, papers, and records of the contractor which are directly pertinent to this contract for the purposes of audits, examinations, making excerpts and transcripts. Uh, he goes on to reference the GS um, that puts that paragraph in there. And uh, then he says, in this example, government operations has a legitimate required oversight function over all North Carolina state agencies, including NCOR, as such. Refusing to cooperate with oversight would be contrary to contractual clauses and in this instance, state law. I bring that up because we discussed you requesting information from a contractor. You indicated that you could not compel the contractor to produce. That seems to be contrary to, and I'll provide copies of this to all members of the committee. To the, the previous stance the agency has taken on providing um, that information, um, you know, we're talking about roughly um, 200 modulars, I think, Senator Britt, almost $50 million contract. I, it would seem that, I mean, you wouldn't have special contracts for one vendor and special ones for another. They would all have the same requirements. So the stance in the past has been that you do have the power to compel that information. But I'll, I'll skip over that and say, okay, maybe you do, maybe you don't. I, I, I think you do, but I know it wasn't 
exercised. Um, I've sat up here and heard that a, a large number of complaints are about this vendor. I've heard you say that you've terminated contracts with a couple of, of vendors, um, but still something's not adding up to me if there's this big volume of business there. You know you're coming in here and you're going to take heat and you're going to be accountable for this. You were smart enough, and I know you're smart, you were shining up that slide, but you did not terminate the contract with this problem vendor before you came in here. Now that doesn't make sense to me. It makes no sense, the math doesn't work, it doesn't add up, it feels like there are numbers that are missing that I don't have and the information that I don't have because if you are responsible and the person who's, or entity that's supposed to be helping you is not delivering, I can't imagine why you would leave them in place. Liquidated damages, uh, part of the, the contract that you guys have chosen not to enforce in the past. I'll also add that, that document sharing provision, uh, modular production, timeliness requirements. Those are not in there to protect the agency or attorneys at DPS. They're in there to protect the people of North Carolina, those citizens sitting out there. So when they're just arbitrarily waived because someone doesn't think there's enough time, they're the ones that get hurt and they're the ones that are supposed to have that. That doesn't add up for me either. I can't believe that this contractor, vendor, whatever you want to call them, I can't believe they've met the requirements of their contract to deliver based upon what we're seeing. So I have a simple question for you. Do you believe that vendor has met all of the requirements for their contract? We do not, you know this, I've said this to you before, we are serious about our contracts. We hold our vendors accountable. There is nothing in that contract that would necessitate me canceling that contract right now. If I cancel that contract right now, then the numbers of people who are waiting on the modular homes that are being manufactured in the factories right now, they lose out. And so there is always the balance of, is terminating to make a point better than getting the units out because I know they're in production right now? I disagree when you say you have held people accountable. I disagree. The, the people in the hotel rooms disagree. Many of my colleagues disagree. The, the provisions in that contract are what holds people accountable. I don't think it would be terminating someone to make a point when they have failed to produce. This is why people hate government. The lack of accountability, the lack of accountability for employees or programs, the lack of measurement, the, the lack of, of follow through. Uh, Something is not right about this. It feels untowards to me that this is being left in place and, and nothing is being done about it. And I, I think based on some questions I heard down from the end, some other people feel the same way and they think, wait a minute, Director Hogshead is smart. She did try to come in and shine this thing up as much as she could. I'm beginning to wonder if there's more to the story about why you haven't taken more action than you have. So just to cover all bases on this, have you sought permission to terminate that contract and been told that you could not? No, I have not because that contract is producing. There have been other general contractors that have walked away from their contracts. This one has not walked away. It is slower than we all want, but this vendor has not walked away. Others have. This is a process. Getting those designs through the factories, getting to production is where we are now. We know how many are rolling off the lots every, I'm sorry, the manufacturing lines every month. Director Hogshead, if you believe that this contractor is producing I think that is part of the problem because that, that's not producing in my view, in, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know how we could go wrong by trying to find another producer. Um, you know, this, this just doesn't 
it doesn't add up to me. It, it something smells about this that that is that is left in place. I think if we want to talk about accountability, then we have to do something about these situations. Um, you know, I don't know what in the world the two contractors who were terminated could have done that would be worse than what this contractor seems to be doing today. I've got serious concerns over this and I think it warrants more attention in the future. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Senator Perry. Director Hogshead, it's been quite a lengthy time for you. I want to thank you for your uh, for you coming to the committee today. At this time, I would dismiss you from committee. Sir, may I, may I mention something that I you did can. not? You can. You can have a moment, yes. There are case managers here. There are folks here that can give answers to any of the families that want to talk to some of our experts. So if anyone would like to talk to experts, they are available in the hallway. Thank you. Thank you. Secretary Buffalo, if you'd make your way to the table, please. Give a moment for Sergeant Barnes to get your tent set. Sir, if you would raise your right hand. Do you affirm that your testimony is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. You may be seated and please uh, begin with your remarks. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen. I've met many of you before, but for those I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I am Eddie Buffalo, the Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Public Safety. I've just completed my first year in this role, and while it seemed to go by fast, I've gained a significant amount of insight into the department's operations in that short time. During the first year with DPS, my goal was to become familiar with many department missions and their successes and challenges. One of the most critical missions is the topic of discussion here today, hurricane recovery. Our state works as a team to respond to the needs of families after a disaster, working with North Carolina Emergency Management, FEMA, Office of State Budget and Management, Disaster Recovery, the General Assembly, and the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resiliency to provide immediate relief and long-term sustainable recovery to our communities. I'm proud to say that since Hurricane Matthew, our team has helped to rebuild over 10,000 homes, but we have much more work to do. NCOR was created by the General Assembly in late 2018 after two devastating hurricanes hit the state in as many years. NCOR is charged with administering the state's federal HUD disaster recovery and mitigation funding with a key mission of helping hurricane survivors rebuild smarter and stronger. For those of you who don't know, I am a North Carolinian, having grown up in eastern rural North Carolina, in a small town called Potty Casey, with approximately 833 people. I've spent much of my life in eastern North Carolina in a part of that state, and know firsthand what it feels like to experience these devastating hurricanes and the ongoing struggle of disaster recovery. That's why I know that it is critical that we continue to work as a team to finish the job of recovery from Hurricanes Matthew and Florence. As I have learned more about hurricane recovery and the difficult work of administering the CDBG our funds, I've tried to help my team identify and remove major impediments to getting people back into their homes. I think that we are making progress, but I also know that we have more challenges ahead. As you know, HUD disaster recovery funding is a program of last resort. We are required to follow complex federal guidelines with multiple steps that can lead to delays. As we discussed in the previous hearing, the COVID-19 pandemic caused significant supply chain disruptions and contractor and labor shortages in rebuild program as it did for everyone working on hurricane recovery. While these have all been challenges, they are not excuses. It is not okay that families are still displaced. I know many people have suffered while waiting for their home to be rebuilt. 
I know many have been living in hotels and other rentals and have struggled to get on and to get by on a day-to-day -day basis. This is unacceptable. And while progress has been made, we still have a lot of work to do. So my priorities are simple. One, that we get more people into step eight, which is the completion phase of their home more quickly. Right now, 899 people are back in their homes and our team knows that we need to pick up that pace. We are pushing hard to get others back home and have made some progress. But more must be done. And we are committed to getting those projects finished quickly. Secondly, get people out of long-term temporary housing so they can have sustainability and a solid foundation in which they live their daily lives. Temporary Rental Assistance, or TRA, is an important tool that we offer to ensure that our families have somewhere to go while their homes are being rebuilt. But we know that those families have been on TRA far too long. We are prioritizing getting them home as soon as possible. Thirdly, most importantly, we have prioritized re-earning the trust of families that we serve by focusing on improving constituent services. Like many of you, I've learned firsthand through site visits to rebuild projects just how difficult life can be for many families we serve. They deserve our immediate attention to address problems, and we are committed to doing that. These are my priorities to get us where we need to be. NCOR has made significant headway in obtaining more contractors and suppliers, shortening the time frame for vendor payment, and reducing contract paperwork, all of which are steps towards getting homes built faster. We are also finding that supply chains and labor supply are in better shape, though we still face challenges there. We are also streamlining the rebuild process. We have simplified eligibility requirements a less burdensome application process, increased flexibility of policy to accommodate the unique needs of these families. Among the most important changes, NCORA's overhaul is case management structure, bringing all staffing in-house to ensure program participants have the same case manager from beginning to end, and they don't get passed off between people. This is improving communication and allowing NCORA to be more responsive and supportive to an individual homeowner's needs. One year into this job, I think we've turned the corner in addressing many of the problems that led to project delays and shortcomings in our customer service. The numbers do show improvement, but I won't be satisfied until everyone is back in their home. I look forward to working with you to achieve that goal. Director Hogshead has provided you an in-depth detail of program changes. And for now, I'd like to assure you that DPS team is fully engaged in correcting any lingering issues at NCOR and getting North Carolinians back in their homes as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, as Chair, I'm going to take this time for myself to ask you a few questions. You and I have not had an opportunity to circle up on these matters. Uh, again, thank you for making yourself available to the committee today. You answered my first question. So you were appointed about a year ago. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. What is NCOR's mission? NCOR's mission is to help those families that are affected by hurricanes or devastating disasters uh, to make them resilient again and recover. And what do you see DPS's role in that? DPS's role is if any director in that division or that division recognizes any problems that we identify those problems uh, and solve, have solutions for those problems. How do we get here? How do we fix it? And how do we keep it from happening again when future storms do happen in our state? I know you've only been here a year, but I'm sure being uh, serving in eastern North Carolina like you've had, you've, you've had the opportunity to work during the hurricanes and what we went through. Um, are you pleased with the NCOR's progress over the last few years? No, th this, these storms, these two 500-year storms have been devastating, sir. Uh, they're challenging. Uh, we, the federal government says that we're on pace. I don't believe that we're on pace to serve our North Carolinians to get them back into their homes. And so the pace we're at is not acceptable, and we have 
to return our fellow citizens back to their homes. Yeah, I, I ask you to look over your shoulder and I think they were absolutely agreed. I don't think we're on pace by no means. Um, since becoming secretary, what steps have you taken to hold NCOR responsible for where they're at? Uh, the metrics in place is that number one, that we continue to trend, that the trend increases uh, daily, monthly. Uh, that we remove any obstacles that are in their way. Uh, we have identified uh, where contractors were not getting paid uh, based on our, our state uh, requirements. So we made some changes to reduce that net 30 pay uh, so we can hopefully attract more contractors to get our fellow North Carolinians back in their homes. Uh, we've also moved our constituent services away from a third party vendor. Uh, back to state employees that are invested in federal in, in their fellow state employees to make sure that we get them back into their homes. Those uh, uh, constituents who are in TRA uh, that have been there over a year that we elevate that and look at that more closely and, and, and more finally of how we can speed up that process and get them out of hotels and back into their homes. Um. Since becoming secretary, how many face-to-face -face meetings have you had with Director Hogshead? Oh, face-to-face, uh, WebEx, uh, every two weeks, sir. Okay, so your, your, it's your testimony that y'all meet every two weeks? Yes, sir, barring any scheduling conflicts. Okay. Um, when, did that, when did that start? Um, can't give you an exact date, but it's been going on for a while. A while being a month, a while being 11 months? A uh, while uh, every two weeks, maybe since I've been here. So I've been here a little so over 12 months. So every two weeks for 12 months, y'all have met face to face at some time about what's going on? At least in the last six months, I would say every two weeks, yes, sir. Six months more of a safe statement than 12 I, months? I, I would say that. But before that, I did have meetings, regular meetings with, with her. But you would say the previous six months, a lot less than the current six months that were behind us now, right? Yes, the last okay. six months. Yes. So since NCOR has been kind of held more accountable, they've been wanting to meet with you more, correct? Well, we want to identify problems within the program to alleviate those problems and to get these folks back into their homes. Would, would that be a yes? Yes, I mean, that's Thank the you. purpose Thank of you, meeting sir. is okay. to strategize to identify problems. Yes, sir. Um, has anyone from NCOR... Um, did they seek to increase the dollar limit on assignable projects with you? Increase the dollar limit? I believe they made that request and it, it was granted, sir. Okay. I'm not sure if it rose to my level. Okay. Um, Colonel Sanderson in September said a key to his success in South Carolina was being able to report directly to Governor Nikki Haley. This is a question for you. Do you think DPS is a hindrance to in course success by not doing that direct to the governor? Is the middleman a problem? Do you see it being a problem? No, sir. Uh, we, we're, we're a team. This is a team approach. This is a team approach with the General Assembly, NCOR, all of our public-private partners to, to get our fellow North Carolinians back into our homes. Okay. And if this committee asked to see your calendar since become a secretary, how much time will we see on your calendar dedicated to NCOR or Rebuild North Carolina? Uh, the regular meetings, and I've also made two visits down to the impacted areas myself. So in one year, you've made two trips. Yes, sir. Two 500-year hurricanes, people displacing their homes, thousands of th houses not built, two trips. Yes, sir. If you were supervising you, would you think that was adequate? No, it could be. I can definitely do more, but okay. we also try to impact uh, getting these folks back in their homes and identifying problems. Uh, and, and seeing those problems boots on the ground, uh, we were able to go back and, and see where the need was. Okay. And I'm going to go back to what my, my colleagues in the Senate and the House here on liquidated damages. Um, in your opinion, why has NCOR not accessed uh, any, any fines of these contractors? Not sure. I know that's a collaborative approach, as uh, Director Hodge had uh, testified to, but uh, we shouldn't leave no stones unturned. Has anyone from NCOR sought your approval or helped to do this? No, sir. In your opinion, opinion, as being the secretary, the, the leader of DPS, um, what is the rationale for not finding contractors? I think 
due to the fact this is a federal program, uh, it's HUD funding, a little bit more paperwork, a little bit more red tape involved uh, for contractors in that part of the state. Being from that part of the state, uh, I personally myself have, have met with uh, Home Builders Association to try to navigate and recruit contractors. It, it, it's just tough. Um, not finding contractors, and, and, and this has been asked, but I'm going to ask you, not finding contractors, how does that hold them accountable? I'm sorry, By sir. not finding them, how, how, how are you guys holding them accountable? If they're not paying any fines, if there's no, if there's no consequences to them not doing their job, tell me why that's a good thing. I'm not saying it is a good thing. I'm saying that we should not leave any stone unturned. Are you prepared to implement fines going forward? I'm prepared for them to bring anything before me to make this better and put people back into their homes. And I know there's a lot of, a lot of folks who want to ask you some questions, but I'm, I'm going to ask you one, and, um, and I would like an answer on this. Um, before today, how many hours have you spent with the governor's staff preparing for today's committee? Uh, we we prepare uh, weekly. We are invested in this program every single day, okay. every single day that that folks are are not back into their homes and it, 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 they they are still in hotels. They're still in TRAs. We prepare, so I can't give you a, a real number okay. of how we how many hours we spend. Is it safe to say that you had no meeting specifically about this committee with any of the governor's staff? No, that's not safe to say. We have had meetings, yes, sir. The meetings that you had, how long did you prepare with that staff for this meeting today? Uh, approximately three, four hours. So, over a period of time. Yep. You, you met three to four hours to prepare yourself for what we'll be asking. Fair to say? Fair to say. Also, self preparement. Sure. Yes, sir. I am going to. I'm going to yield now mm -hmm. to Senator Jarvis for some questions. Thank you for answering the questions, Secretary. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Buffalo, I believe, if I recall correctly, you either are a law enforcement officer or have been. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I thought I remembered that. During the time that you uh, were on patrol, may have been a few years ago, did you ever pull anybody over for speeding? Yes, sir. Were they ever issued a warning? Yes. On some occasions. If, if they came back and you picked the same car out the next day and the following day and the following day, if that took place over a week period of time, did you continue to give warnings? That's a hard question to ask. I mean, it depends on the speed. So if it happened for month after month, you picked them up, 12, 14 times, they would continue to get warnings? Uh, at, at some point, there, there would have to be uh, some type of consequence. And, and I, I respect that. Um, if you're a law enforcement officer and you only issued warnings and never issue a citation, do you think that the speeders would continue to have confidence in you as a law enforcement officer? And would they respect your authority as a law enforcement officer? It's a loaded question, but I, I think it could go both ways. So, on the other side, if you have written citations to one individual, on multiple occasions. Eventually, will they lose their license? I'm not sure, sir, of the... Based on it, the point system in the state of North Carolina. Based on the point system without looking at the totality of the circumstances, I mean, possibly they could, yes. The majority of the, the question would be yes, if, if you look at the law. Um, and you know where I'm going with this. Uh, Secretary Buffalo, you know that as a law enforcement officer, there's always room for leniency. There, there's some leniency to be given. It's okay, but in general, 
penalties exist to deter bad behavior. Would you not agree to that? Yes, sir. Prior to uh, today, it's my understanding that Nucor or Encore, would, it was their complete decision as to or not to implement liquidated damages. Uh, after hearing the report from uh, Director Hogshead, I believe that there is more people involved in making that decision. It's not just her solely. Is that correct? No discussion has been brought to me about liquidated damages, but if uh, she brings it to me, we will have a general counsel and everybody else involved. Okay. So you would not prohibit or discourage NCOR from assessing liquidated damages? Our goal is to get families returned back into their home and not leave any stones unturned, sir. So, in, in our last uh, hearing, um, we had a report from Colonel Sanderson. And I think he addressed this. Are you aware of that um, meeting? Have you, pay, have you listened to that meeting? When he testified back in September? Yes, yes sir. Uh, I, I think he addressed the fact that that would indicate getting people back in their homes more quickly. I, I believe he did. Uh. Okay. So today we've heard that the policy has evolved and NCOR will begin assessing liquidated damages sometime in 2023. Why would that change come now, after three years? I believe that change will come now because we possibly have identified a problem. We need to fix it, and we need to keep it from happening again in order to get families back into their homes. So you don't believe that it had anything to do with the pressure from this body has put in enlightening what needs to be done? I think being in this room back in September and today, we look at things uh, comprehensively, and that's part of it. But the goal still is not going to change. The goal is still to get all these families back into their homes. So accountability is not a big goal? That is part of the goal. That's why we don't leave any stones unturned when you look at the program comprehensively. So I know that uh, Director Hogshead had said before in the last meeting she was afraid that it would run contractors off. However, just like I just spoke about, Colonel Sanderson said that's not the case. You've got to have the carrot and the stick approach in order to motivate contractors. Sure, you may lose some of the contractors. There may be some you get rid of, but if they're not performing, we don't need them in the program. If we look at numbers, like my other senators have, have mentioned, and the numbers, they're producing, but they're not really producing what they said. It's a breach of contract. And whenever you breach that contract, if there's no penalty and no repercussion, why should they do different? Why should they try to change? Um, you know, I think the most important thing we have here today that we've got to assess is getting these families back in their home and holding, holding contractors accountable is a piece of that to get people back in their home and i don't i don't see that we need to continue to keep coddling contractors especially especially those who drag their feet to not produce and not do what they say they're going to do go for 78 days without even showing up on the job uh and you're saying that's Okay, 
No, sir, I didn't say that was okay. I said that if we identify that as a problem, we assess that problem, we fix it, and we make sure that we don't, it doesn't happen again. But we, we wouldn't assess penalty to that specific situation. If, if that's a problem, then we don't leave that stone unturned. We address that issue. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to, in the future, the next time we come in, uh, uh, that, that that will be taken care of. And I got one, one additional question. So do you feel like the traje trajectory that the department in core is on, based on the numbers that we have left out of homes and the numbers that we're producing today, that they will be in their home before the program runs out? Great question, sir. We are better than we were back in September. Is that acceptable? No, no sir. it's not acceptable. But the ultimate goal is that we finish this entire program before that federal dollar grant ends and that we leave no stone unturned to get that done, to get these folks back into their homes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Buffalo, thank you for being here today. Uh, we have not had the chance to meet in the past. However, during your confirmation process, I heard many good things about you and your law enforcement background. Uh, I'm also a native of Eastern North Carolina, so I, I tend to smile when I, I read those hometowns um, like that. But, you know, I'm a small town rural guy, too, and I I got to tell you, based on everything that I've heard in here today, I've felt like I needed to check the members' shoes when they were walking in because I, I keep smelling something and it feels like they get, went out in that cow pasture to get a better look at the bull <laughs> and uh, probably came in with something they shouldn't. Um, I, I hear some talking points being reiterated and one was in your written testimony and it was about 10,000 homes and you know it's a standard talking point I, I've heard it before I've heard it from the the governor back last summer heard you say it her others say it um, but you guys haven't built 10,000 homes or put 10,000 homes on the ground um, Encor hasn't done that, not, not FEMA, not OSBM, but, but Encor. Uh, of those 10,000, I, I think you, you might be able to claim about 7% of those, maybe about 700. And I, I start with that to say that, you know, we, we don't want talking points. We, we want these folks back in their homes. We want changes that, that matter, that move the needle and get things going. We don't want promises of... Uh, something improving. We, we just want results. That's what we all should want. Uh, but we keep polishing these things up. So we, we really want to talk about th this is a failed recovery program from two hurricanes. And we, we really want you to be here to, you know, explain to us a, as you see it, why it's going so, so miserably. Um, I was hoping you'd have some fresh eyes and, and walk in and, and be able to give us the, the, the feeling that not only have you looked at it with fresh eyes, but you have a fresh direction with where you're going to go to, to make a difference. Because he, I gotta tell you, it feels like the same old talking points um, and lack of accountability for the program. And that's just me, one Eastern North Carolina person being uh, straight with another one. That, that's what I feel like we see. Um, but let's get back to 10,000 homes because that seems to be what everybody has rehearsed. So why hasn't that number changed since June uh, when I heard the governor talk about it? 10,000 homes, why, why isn't the number higher? It's actually over 10,000 homes once you include EM, OSBM, DR, VOADS, as well as the NCORE numbers, you do have over 10,000 homes over that entire uh, uh, program. So the, the homes that the other people, other organizations built too. 
other organizations that are part of uh, hurricane recovery and disaster recovery, mm -hmm. the only difference with NCOR, these are HUD funds, a little bit more complex uh, guidelines and restrictions where the VOADs, EM, and OSBM, DR move a little bit quicker. So, Secretary Buffalo, you feel like the, the program has, has turned the corner. Uh, I'm, again, I'm a math guy. I'm just looking at the throughput, right? I'm, I'm looking at that. Uh, 2025 deadline, that 2026 deadline, when the money's gone, and uh, I don't see it. I, I, I don't see it. I, I see some, we see some peaks and valleys, but being where we need to be on a Gantt chart with that kind of throughput, it's never going to happen. Tell me what you see that, that I don't. How is, how is NCOR going to be able to fix this? under what is ultimately, I guess, your leadership. Yes, sir. I, I see a team effort that we've turned the corner. I see, number one, uh, keep having discussions with you all, with your support in trying to help us uh, galvanize and recruit more contractors in the areas that are affected in which uh, you all represent as well. I see it as a team effort. I see it as a fact of getting these contractors paid a little bit more quicker. Uh, they get to turn around to increase their sustainability to bid on these particular uh, packages within the affected areas. Uh, I see uh, staying engaged. Uh, I see staying engaged with the folks that are seated behind me and those folks that are seated in front of me. Keep having these transparent conversations. But the ultimate goal is to finish this project and the ultimate goal is to get these folks behind me back into their homes. That's what I see under my leadership. That's the governor's initiative. These folks have always been a priority. They will continue to be a priority. I understand living in rural Potty Casey, North Carolina, where my mom and dad still live at the age of 83 and 91. I understand the struggles in which they face each and every day. So it's not only a, a professional me, it's personal to me. It's very personal to me because I want these folks to be able to lay into their bed at night on Christmas Day as we are all afforded that same opportunity. So it's personal to me that we do that. It's not just a, a talking points. So you, you believe that these people have been made a priority? They have been made a priority. We're, we're not where we were in the beginning of this program. We are a lot better than where we were even at, at September. But are we on pace? No. Am I satisfied where we are? No. But the ultimate goal is these folks behind me. And we can do that as a team effort between the General Assembly, DPS, our public and private partnerships, because this is personal. Secretary Buffalo, in your opinion, you know, we, we discussed a, a contractor up here, and I see a trend with this contractor with mobile home issues, contractor issues, complaints. Um, we talk about accountability. Secretary Buffalo, how, how is there accountability if two other contractors have been let go and one contractor who appears to be where the majority of the problems come from are left in place? How is that accountability? I think we, I think we go back and take a deeper dive, sir, and look Fair. at that. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly uh, not, you know, not willing to do that. I am willing to do that. Go take a deeper dive and look at what happened and solve that particular problem to fix it. Because at the end of the day, it's these folks behind me. And, but I also know that we got to fix those problems and we got to overcome those problems in order for these homes to be built. How many homes are in the pipeline now? How many have they already built? So those are more questions that I would like to ask to come back to you with a transparent answer and a discussion in order to get these folks behind me back into their homes. I appreciate that, Mr. Secretary. I'm happy to go along on that ride with you to look more deeply into that. But I appreciate that response of your willingness to dig more deeply into that matter. I thank you for that, Mr. Yes, Chairman. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Buffalo, thank you for being here today and, and thanks for uh, your service. Um, I, I've asked this 
to everyone that's sat in front of us, and I'm going to ask it to you as well. So don't take it as I'm just asking you a question I haven't asked others. Um, Director Hogshead stated that it was her responsibility for the shortcomings of the program. It was the very first thing she said to us in September, and she's repeated it. Um, and I, as I said earlier, I appreciated uh, her as a leader acknowledging that. So what I'm asking you is do you acknowledge and accept responsibility as the agency head? Because I didn't see it in your letter and I didn't hear it from you so far in the hearing. So I just want to be clear. I think I've heard it indirectly, but I just want to clearly understand that you, as the leader of the agency that NCOR sits under, that you acknowledge and accept responsibility for the shortcomings. Sir, this is a team approach. We all accept responsibility, including myself. I accept responsibility of what has happened, but I also accept responsibility and the challenge to get these folks back in their own. I appreciate that, and I figured you would say that, and I do appreciate that. I think it's important we as leaders, and you as an old military guy as well, uh, we lead from the front and we take responsibility, so I appreciate that comment. One of the top priorities you said in your statement, actually you said it was a critical mission, is to get people back in their homes, and, and this program is a critical mission. You mentioned the home visits that you went on. I think you said two. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more to me and to this uh, committee on what did, those, what did that visit look like? Did you meet with people? Did you meet with contractors? Did you just drive by the, the site? I'm not saying that's what you did, but can you elaborate a little bit more? And for me, it's always about muddy boots leadership, and that means you're on the ground and you understand what's happening. As an old Army guy, uh, that's that's what we do. And the only way you can truly understand something is to see it firsthand with your set of eyes. And you're exactly right, sir. In order for me to understand this program holistically, I wanted to go and see for myself. And so I went to Bladen, Columbus, Robeson, all of those counties that were affected, Scotland County, uh, down in that area. Uh, went and met with a, a, a young lady in her home who showed me uh, work that she was not pleased with. It was a rehab uh, that she wasn't pleased with. Ex sat down and had conversations with her about her discontentment and reassured her that you are a priority. So that was one of the homes. Went to homes where there was, uh, a, it was demolished, where they had not poured the foundation yet. The permits had not been signed yet. Uh, went back for a second visit as a follow-up to inspect what I expect. And in inspecting that, saw that the foundation had been poured, that the A-frame was there. Progress had been made. We had turned the corner on that particular uh, uh, project. And I can't remember the exact address. I, I want to say it was outside of Fair Bluff. Uh, left that residence, went to another residence where the A-frame was still on the, on, on the, uh, on the ground. Uh, they were still working on the foundation. Went back to inspect what I expected, and the A-frame was up. They had encased the house. And so progress had been made. Each one that I visited, both times, progress had been made. All the way to the point where keys were offered. An occupancy permit was offered, where families were back into their home prior to Thanksgiving. And so progress had been made on each one of the ones that I had visited, sir. And it's great to hear progress was made, Mr. Secretary. From your visits, did you, as the agency head, based on what you saw firsthand, did you, did it, did you change any procedures? Did you talk with Director Hogshead to say, hey, we need to look at doing maybe this a little bit different or this isn't working? Or did it cause you to actually not just look at the progress, which is great, but actually identify and overcome any of the, the obstacles that were there? Yes, sir. We, we talked about uh, our visit uh, holistically. We talked about how we can improve that, how we could uh, get more contractors involved. Uh, didn't see any issues with the sites that I visited, but holistically, all of Encore in, in, in one big bucket Yes, yeah, so we talked about the need that these small contractors were not getting paid in a timely manner to pay their workforce to keep them coming back to work, to work on each project in order for each project to move forward, to trend forward in the right direction. 
because these small contractors, they were having difficulty making payroll. And so we had to change that to keep those folks coming back to work, to work on those houses in order to trend in the right direction. So yes, sir. I would just, if you happen to make further visits, it would, uh, I would make a recommendation, not tell you how to do your job. I make a recommendation to ask one of these representatives or senators to go see an area that they've been talking with the constituent for several months. Um, so you can see some of the, the harder issues uh, and the harder uh, problems that uh, our constituents are, are seeing that we're making progress, but maybe you can identify something that you could at your level overcome. The, the last question that I would state, and I guess it's more of a comment than a question, um, you said this was personal and a priority, and I, as a legislature, I'm never going to tell uh, organizationally how to handle their organization but it's it's interesting to me because this is we really haven't had a good picture in the organizational structure but it's interesting to me that because this is a priority and, and it's personal for you as you said that director hogg says isn't, isn't a direct line supervisor to you that she flows through the chief of staff and I, and i think if we look at your other agency directors they probably or the other directors they probably have a direct line to you so I'm just interested in that. I don't know if that potentially could speed up things, as we've heard earlier, uh, with that direct line of communication or that direct report. Um, but just a just an observation as an outside. Again, I don't pretend to tell you how to do your job because I'm just a legislator. Um, but it was just a unique uh, observation, um, Mr. Chairman. I'll turn back over to my time. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Senator. You. Senator Waddell, you're recognized. I, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I want to also thank Secretary Buffalo for your in-depth presentation. And I know you mentioned that one of your ultimate goals is to get families back into their homes. But there are some things that you saw when you made your two visits, when you visit and talk with families and saw the things that are going on with them. Is there anything from that or from these visits when you talk with them personally that you would have us as this General Assembly to call attention to and to come up with legislation that will make it better. I think in working with Director Hogshead, as she said, she's uh, developing a comprehensive list to bring back for you. And so in talks with her, we, we will definitely uh, work in tandem uh, to bring that back to you collectively. And the second question is, you mentioned some things, that, oh, some things were mentioned about the federal guidelines that many of those things presented obstacles. And as you visit it, how can you see this being improved? Uh, to, that, that will be part of that comprehensive list report. Uh, as Director Hogshead had testified to earlier that uh, some of the stringent guidelines on the federal side of this particular program are not on the EM, OSBM, DR, or VOET side of the house to encompass those 10,000, over 10,000 homes that have already been built across North Carolina. All right, that's it. Thank you so much. Representative Willingham, you're recognized. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Buffalo, good to see you again. <laughs> I have two questions. Uh, how many other agencies are that you're responsible for? Ooh, about uh, 15, I believe. Okay, now I ask that question because I know that you can't have everybody report it directly to you. So it has to be some kind of buffer, which, which happens. The other thing is, uh, as a former law enforcement officer myself, I know that, uh, and, and this is getting back to that contractor who uh, seemed to have one that had all the problems. Um, the question I would ask, and, and you might know this or you might have to ask Ms. Hogsack, how many other projects that this contractor was working on or involved in? Um, yeah. I can't hear you. So the director, if you would step to the mic and then. I apologize. That contractor has completed 179 homes to date. Okay, 179? Yes. Okay. And, and the reason I ask that, of course, uh, you know, it's easy to say get rid of somebody or to fire somebody, but you have to look at a whole bunch of things. That's in, uh, what is the effect on other things that you're dealing with? Uh, the question, you know, involving the 
or the analogy we were talking about the police officer uh, or law enforcement, uh, I can tell you uh, as a police officer on many occasions, I arrested uh, one person numerous times <laughs> and, uh, and numerous times uh, they were, of course they were arrested, but at the same time uh, they were not charged. Even though they did what they were, you know, they did something I thought they should be arrested for. But there were a lot of extenuating circumstances each time. And you, you might not think about this, but every instance, I mean, uh, everyone is different. And sometimes you get one that, I mean, they have a lot of reasons why things happen to them. Uh, and I had that um, experience. So I can understand that even with this contractor, uh, you know, you, you see, I'm sure there were a lot of things involved in uh, what was happening for this situation to come about. So I would suspect that, um, you know, those things that happened were things that had you to come to the conclusion that this person or this contractor should continue uh, with the projects. So uh, I, I just want us to keep in mind that you know, nothing is cut and dry or black and white. There's a lot of things involved, and I think that as a responsible person, you know, you want to take all those things in consideration when you make that decision, and I think you guys did that. Uh, so I just want to bring that up. Thank you. Representative Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and Secretary Buffalo, uh, thank you. I, I, as having been long time involved in the General Assembly and part of the JPS budget, I know that you have a lot of things on your plate. So I do appreciate the time and attention you're giving to this separate project because I know it's not the bulk of what you do. <coughs> when you went out into some of these districts and met people affected by hurricane, the hurricanes, did you meet with any of those that were TRAs? I don't believe so. All right. And when did you first discuss with um, Ms. Hogshead the use of liquidated damages? I have not personally had a conversation with her about liquidated damages. Okay. How about other, uh, what other remedies have you talked to her about with enforcing contracts, trying to get our contractors to do what they've committed to do? Um, no discussion about enforcement of contracts. All right. Now, you've been there almost a year. Is that right? Yes, over you said a year. That y'all meet weekly or bi weekly? Bi weekly. Okay. And you see some of the progress, some of the same kind of charts we're seeing? Yes, ma'am. We didn't know until we got in here in, in September, but there were only an average of five completed houses per month from January until August of this year. Did that surprise you? I think the numbers, if I'm not mistaken, on her PowerPoint was a little better than five without going back to her PowerPoint right. to look and, at it. And, and I'll be happy to, to send you back there, but it was five completed per month through August. Okay. And then from August till now, she indicated there's been a 242% increase. Is that impressive for you? As I said before in my previous testimony that um, it's not acceptable where we are. The pace needs to increase. Because that, that was only 17 homes per month as opposed to five per month. And when we're trying to get to 4,200, that's an issue. Um, there was also some comments about being able to write checks to satisfy 35 of these 40-some hundred people that need help. And that happened between September and now. I, I just wonder from an administrative perspective why that didn't happen any quicker, if you know. I'm not sure, ma'am. I know we identified it as a problem, uh, fixed a problem to keep it from not happening again. And, and I'm glad you're there. And I really hope you keep some more active supervision um, because we're never going to get to finish in those 4,000 homes if this is the rate at which we continue. And, and we're concerned that some of this improvement didn't happen until we started overseeing. So hopefully we, we have your attention and we'll probably continue to do some oversight. 
but thank you. We're going to close with Senator Jackson for last questions and comments. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Buffalo, thank you for being here. Good to see you again, sir. And your reputation, as you well know, has preceded you in what we think of you and why you were so favorable in the confirmation. And I have all faith in you that you will, you're on top of this now. And as uh, Representative Stevens just said, you know, we didn't realize until September how dire this situation was, and, and that's probably on our part of not knowing. Um, but you mentioned a time or two about you had metrics that you were putting in place or standards. Would you in the future be willing to maybe let us know periodically how those metrics are being accomplished and so we can move forward? Because, at, and, I, and I'm sure you will or your staff will be glad to give us that information. But as I've sat here and thought about this and I've thought about you know how frustrated we all are it's not going to accomplish and get us one inch closer to getting these folks back in their homes. So I want to assure you that everybody up here on this side and down on that side is willing to sit down and help Director Hodgegood, Secretary Buffalo, to work together. As you said about your team, we're a team here too and we can be a team together. There's enough fault in this fiasco to go around, no doubt about that. But we've got, we have got to move forward. And, you know, we're, as we know, we're not going to get these folks in their homes that are out of them by Christmas. But there is Valentine's Day. There's Easter. Mm -hmm. And we'll be here shortly in full session. And my door, and I know most of these members, this doors is always open to help the citizens and the agencies when needed. So thank you all for being here today, Director Hosgood. Secretary Buffalo, I appreciate it. Ms. Albritton, thank you for being here and what you're doing. I know me and legal aid has not always seen eye to eye on certain things, but I appreciate what you're doing here. <laughs> but um, citizens, victims, you are victims. Thank you for being here. One of the ladies in the documentary, which is here tonight or today, made the comment when she got back in her home, she was not going to give up this fight. God bless you, should, because this is a fight. And we're all here to make it better. Because these, these last two hurricanes are not going to be the last ones. There's going to be more. If we're still here on this earth, there's going to be more hurricanes, there'll be more wildfires, there'll be more mountain floods. So we're here to work together and come up with a better plan to make this work. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Secretary, uh, Secretary Buffalo, uh, I too want to thank you. You've had a year of drinking out of fire hose. <laughs> it's been a lot to learn in a short amount of time, and I know this is just part of it. Please don't feel attacked. There's a lot going on. We want to be a resource for you and your folks. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, at this time, you are dismissed from committee. If you'd like to make a last comment. Thank you, Representative Jones. I, I assure you, Senator Jackson and the rest of the entire committee, uh, we're committed to this. They are our priority. And we want to join with you in a collaborative effort to get these folks back in their home. That's what they deserve. And, and I know you all want that to happen. And we here at DPS and NCOR and the governor's office, we want it to happen too, sir. So thank you for the opportunity to come and present to you today. You're dismissed, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, in closing, to our folks here who have been displaced, for quite some time, to the folks that couldn't be here, to the folks that fell through the cracks, understand one thing. You've been failed. It's not the Secretary personally, it's not Director Hogshead personally, but you have been failed. And I'm frustrated because I come from this district, down in Columbus and Robinson. And the home that the Secretary got to see with the trusses up and the, and the A there, that is wonderful, but it's only taken three years to get there. You've been failed. But with this committee's help and, and, and working with ANCOR and working with the Secretary, we are committed to you. We cannot bring back the loved ones that you've lost. And I know you've lost them in this. And I know health has changed for many of you. You will be in our prayers. 
but you also have a commitment from this committee that we will keep holding accountability that this, ma'am, doesn't happen again, and thank you again. We will work to make sure that we're in a better place and we hold the administration accountable for what has happened to you. There are still 3,000 people in the process, and who knows how many more have fell through the cracks would rebuild. Y'all, you're running out of time. The federal money to fix these issues is going to be gone. You're not going to be able to help these families at the current build rate and the time frame we have. It's basic math. It's plain to see. We as a state can only hope that Governor Cooper, with the assistance of Secretary Buffalo and Director Hogshead, sees the grim reality. And they will continue doing everything in their power to move this as fast as possible. There was promises made and promises weren't kept. We will keep holding them accountable. We'll do what it takes to get you back. Now, we're going to have a committee meeting again on March 15th, if not before, if the director comes, secretary comes, and we need to meet earlier. But if not, March 15th is going to be our date. God bless y'all. This committee's adjourned.
So I decided to run for Congress in an effort Mr. President. The Senator from North Carolina. Mr. President, I rise today in the time-honored tradition of giving my farewell remarks to the United States Senate. This is an opportunity to thank my friends, my colleagues. Mr. President. The Senator from North Carolina. Mr. President, I rise today in the time-honored tradition of giving my farewell remarks to the United States Senate. This is an opportunity to thank my friends, my colleagues, the voters of North Carolina who have supported me for 28 years through eight elections for the opportunity to serve and the ability to make a difference for my state and my country. 30 years ago, I was a businessman with a happy family in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, who decided things in Washington, D.C. weren't working exactly right. So I decided to run for Congress in an effort to help make that change for the better. My reason for running was a concern of the future for my two young sons and others of their generation. I lost that first race for the House in 1992, and I took it in stride thinking, I've done my best shot. It was meant to be not a politician. I'd never run for office before or been involved in politics except to vote. But by 1994, as Congress was still raising taxes and increasing the deficit at the same time, I decided I had to try again to bring some common sense to how things were being decided in our nation's capital. So I threw my hat in the ring again, and I was elected to the House of Representatives. I was surrounded by 73 other new members with a new majority and an opportunity to make new friends. I met three people who are now some of my closest friends. John Boehner, Saxby Chambliss, and Tom Latham. Brooke and I are blessed for their friendship. Every year since they've left, their wives, Debbie Boehner, Julianne Chambliss, and the late Kathy Latham, have traveled and deepened those bonds of friendship. And I'm grateful and proud we're so incredibly close, and I thank all of them today. I suppose Boehner's crying by now. <laughs> While we have uh, all made new friends in Congress, not a day goes by, not a day, that I don't miss my good friend Tom Coburn. I have his nameplate in my office from the Intel Committee to remind me the lessons that Tom gave all of us and for the example he set 
as a member of the Senate. Now from that class of 1994, there are only three of us left, Roger, Lindsey, and me. And my time is short. The contract with America created a new majority. Newt Gingrich and Frank, Frank Luntz crafted our unifying message to the American people. We came with a commitment not to leave for 100 days until we started to change the course of American government. Then this seemed like a small sacrifice for a transformation I saw as imminent and important. We worked day and night before we ever found the bathroom or permanent housing. Every member had a different story and a different reason for running, but we were elected for a common cause to fix Congress and a government that was broken and out of touch. Being one of 435 representatives in an institution driven by seniority has a sobering impact. For many, our new committee assignments taught us that we weren't quite as smart as we thought. Winning elections was hard. Thoughtful policy making was even harder. I decided early on that the Energy, Energy and Commerce Committee is where I'd spend the majority of my time and focus. Much can be said for the value of institutional knowledge, but there weren't any Republicans who knew what to do in the majority since none of us had ever served in the majority. John Dingell was the outgoing chair of the committee, and quite honestly, John could have ignored the new Republicans and been upset about the election taking his gavel away. Instead, he took me under his wing. John taught me many lessons about hearings, about oversight, how to focus on important topics, and more importantly, how to work, how the work in Washington really gets done. He advised me to spend my time listening, so I did. Came to the committee hearings, and I learned from the experts. I was doing so much at one time, I realized that family time was too often ignored. I cannot express how much appreciation for the love and the support of my family to let me have this incredible experience. Brooke and I have lived apart for 28 years. Outside of the congressional recesses or a few trips every Monday, I've had to wake up just like you and know I had to fly back to Washington to cast a vote. I look forward to being home with the love of my life when I'm done with this. During the decade I served in the House, our country went through some major events, including 9-11, the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, which still ripples through our foreign policy, our defense policy, and our domestic policy today. The anthrax attacks, which opened my eyes as to how unprepared our country was for the threat of bioterrorism, and inspired my work to create the National Preparedness and Response Framework. The impeachment of President Clinton, only the second time a president had been impeached in the history of our country in the House. I had the opportunity